Good. Let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, this is our annual conference with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, Germany's Social Democratic Party conference, and we're supported by the foundation, of course, by the DAD, by the Joint Initiative for German and European Studies, and by the Monk School. And I have to say, there's many things I like about Social Democrats. The first is the informality. So when I first lived in Germany, I was quite impressed that members of the audience, when speaking with Chancellor Schroeder, would duzen, which they use the informal, the equivalent of tutoyer in French, and he would respond with the informal du. Now, of course, we don't have this in English, so I'm not wearing a tie today, which is my equivalent of a big hello du to all of you. I am... Um, I am Randall Hansen. I am the interim director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and permanent director of the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. And I'm very much looking forward to today's events as this is the ideal time to hold this symposium. A good time. A good time, but frankly, a gloomy time. For over the last 10 years since the crash and over the last seven years, during which we've held these annual events, things have gone from bad to worse. Support for populist, anti-European anti and anti-immigration parties has risen dramatically, and there's every indication that they're going to do extremely well in the European Parliament elections. Britain, in case you hadn't noticed, is leaving the European Union, and in France, President Macron, the great hope of liberalism and the defense of liberalism, his support is wobbling quite seriously. And across the Atlantic, the President of the United States has come close to declaring Germany enemy number one. Now, some, perhaps most, perhaps all of this is beyond Germany's control. But as the certainly regional, the European hegemon, we have to ask about the relationship between what's happened and Germany's leadership or perhaps lack thereof. And so I'll put out a series of points to you that I'm not necessarily committed to. They're simply thought points that might structure our conversation over the course of the day. And I won't claim originality. These are things that are widely said within the literature and within the press. First, <clears throat> Berlin's obstinance over quantitative easing and stimulus after and during, sorry, during and after the Eurozone crisis has meant that the European recession has been much longer and much deeper than the American equivalent. And the great threat of inflation, the reason ordo liberals told us we could not have quantitative easing, that is the printing of money, that inflation has nowhere to be seen. If inflation is not on the rise, something else certainly is, and that's support for the far right across Europe. Second, President Macron received an extremely tepid response from Merkel and his proposals for Eurozone and broader EU reform. And her Dauphine, AKK, is a deeply provincial figure who, beyond her rather distasteful homophobia, has no obvious vision for Europe. Commentators are now suggesting that Paris and Macron have relied too heavily on Berlin. Well, if Paris is relying too heavily on Berlin, if France can ever rely too heavily on Berlin in matters of European integration, then we're frankly in a very dangerous space. Third, Angela Merkel's claim, which I saluted at the time, of two years ago, that Europe needs to step up the, to the plate and become master of its fate, has been followed, frankly, by very little. And this, I will say, is a feature of Merkel's now very long chancellorship. The very tough decisions that helped get Germany where it is today were frankly made by Social Democrats, notably Agenda 2010, though they've since So what hasn't happened? There's been no great push on European foreign policy, no great increase in defense spending. We're getting a blip up this year, but it's going to be flat over the medium term. And no needed dramatic increase in spending on universities that are overcrowded and often mediocre, 
on infrastructure that is crumbling, or on digitization. And for all the rhetoric there has been in Germany, no concerted global effort led by Berlin to defend the rules-based international order. And I will quote Constanze Stelzenmüller, who is German, as you will guess from the name, and who is a frequent speaker at these uh, FE FES events. She says in the FT, no nation has profited more handsomely from the post-war European order than Germany. None has a greater interest in preserving it. Yet, the Berlin Republic shows little sign of understanding the responsibility it bears and the urgency of our challenge. Now, as I say, I'm not necessarily committed to those thoughts, but I throw them out to you, perhaps to think and reflect on. Uh, I'll now introduce a great friend of the Monk School who will introduce our keynote speaker. After the keynote speech, we will have an opportunity for Q&A, and following standards practice, we'll ask you to write down your questions. Card will, cards will be distributed. Please jot them down. Um, pass them on to me. They'll be passed on to me, and um, that will be about. Now, let me introduce Mr. Schulze, who is the serving Consul General of Germany in Toronto, a role that he's had since mid-September 2018. He joined the German Foreign Office in 1993, and most recently he served as German ambassador to Croatia, prior to which he was head of division of the politi political directorate of the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin with responsibilities for Turkey, for the OSCE, and the Council of Europe, a very, very he also spent many years abroad, including leading positions at German missions in Turkey and Riyadh, and he also served as civilian head of the ISAF Provincial Re Reconstruction Team in Kanduz, Afghanistan. Prior to joining the Foreign Service, Mr. Schulze studied law and acquired the qualification for judicial office, which, as I understand it, involves taking one hell of a difficult exam in Germany. He also holds a Master of Public Administration from the German University of Administrative Sciences in Speyer, and during his legal education, he studied and completed internships in France, in Greece, and in Spain's in New York City. Consul General, Thomas, the floor is yours. Well, I didn't know that, all, that I did all that. So. Uh, but, but, but nice to reminding me. Um, so, um, hello everybody. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, at Monk School. Uh, well, I, I particularly like the work of Monk School and I consider it, uh, after only seven months in, in uh, Toronto already as, as a second home. Um, so, uh, I, I keep the protocol a little bit uh, uh, short. Uh, I, of course, welcome all our distinguished speakers. Uh, the keynote speaker uh, is Wolfgang Schmidt. He's only virtually present uh, because there were some flight issues, so he, he, he couldn't come in person, which I regret very much. Uh, he's State Secretary at the German Ministry of Finance, and you probably know uh, that the Minister of Finance, Olaf Scholz, is also the Vice Chancellor, and uh, Wolfgang Schmidt is very close has always been very close to Olaf Scholz, so uh, he, he will certainly give us uh, a, a very close insight on uh, German political uh, issues, and I encourage you during the Q&A session to really ask questions. He's the one who can politically answer questions. I'm just a neutral German diplomat. But um, I, of course, take this opportunity to, to, to say a few words, and first of all, of course, I, I would like to uh, thank the main organizers and sponsors of this event, Joint Initiative in German and European Studies at the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, Monk School of Global uh, Affairs and Public Policy, Fritz Hebert Foundation, German Academic Exchange Service, DAAD. Well, the, to run a conference in Germany has become a tradition and a reliable anchor in German-Canadian discourse. Why is that so? Well, the topics are always carefully chosen. They are timely, and they address real political issues. And as you can see today, 
the organizers always get the right people together, both from Germany and from Canada. I don't want to elaborate on the very topic of the conference. There are others around who are certainly more competent than I am. Therefore, I would just like to make a few remarks related to Europe and Canada and our common challenges. Prior to coming to Canada, Randall, you said it, last September, I was German's ambassador to Croatia. In 2015, shortly after assuming my duties there, we were confronted, confronted with an unprecedented wave of migration. About 600,000 refugees and other migrants passed through Croatia. Eventually, most of them went to Austria, Germany, and some Scandinavian countries. Why do I mention this many years later in a different position on another continent? Well, migration remains to be a political issue both in Canada and in Europe. In Europe, despite the fact that almost all European societies are becoming more and more multi-ethnic, populist movements try to divide rather than to unite. In Canada, migration is a given. I just returned from Manitoba a few days ago. Politicians there were proud of the fact that this province is attracting more migrants than ever. Migrants drive economic growth in Manitoba as much as they do in Ontario, and in particular here in Toronto. More than half of the population of this vibrant city was not even born in Canada. They are all voters. No party can afford to ignore them. At the contrary, these new Canadians are an integral part of Canadian politics on the federal level as well as on the provincial level. In Europe, we will probably see more people voting for populist movements who seek to alien, uh, alienate our migrant communities rather than integrating them. This is just one of many hot topics in, Euro in the European elections. But it shows the importance of the Canadian-German, the Canadian-European dialogue. We share the same values. We enjoy a long and traditional friendship, but we can also learn from each other. In a world with an increasing number of autocratic leaders who in some cases do not even properly recognize the outcome of elections, we need more cooperation between like-minded partners. To borrow words of the German ambassador to the United Nations, Christoph Heusken, who's been for a long time the advisor of the chancellor, our shared values are based on the premise together first, instead of Germany first or Canada first or whoever first. We share values like democracy, rule of law, tolerance, multilateralism. And we need to jointly stand against aggressive populism, hatred, mistrust, and the use of fake news for political purposes. May I give you one example of a very recent German-Canadian discussion? Just over two weeks ago, the German consulate initiated the first German-Canadian media symposium titled Untruth. Journalism and Democracy in the Digital Age. We even managed to get the chairman of the Federal German Press Conference to Toronto. Together with our partners from Messe College and the University of Toronto Communications Department, UTC, we invited well-known journalists, German as well as Canadian, to exchange their perspectives and discuss ways how to rebuild trust in media and our democratic institutions. It was a very exciting event. Or another good example for what we can do together, how we can learn from each other, migration. In a few weeks, a group of high-profile Canadian migration experts will meet German migration experts in various German cities to exchange expertise and views. Today's conference tackles a different topic, but in my opinion, is intrinsically related to the issues I briefly touched upon. Where, where are we heading to globally? Is globaliz globalization in retreat, as John Walston Saul in his book, Collapse of Clo Globalism, describes? And if so, what can we Canadians and Germans do to counter that? I look very much forward to the contributions of our speakers. And I'm sure we'll have a very lively Q&A session. I wish us all lots of insightful talks and plenty of food for thought. Thank you so much.
and then I made the switch to YouTube, of course. Uh, we, we, we didn't have a choreography on that. So Knut Detlefsen is a representative of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in, in uh, Washington. He's been with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation for a very long time with a lot of uh, different assignments abroad. So the, the guys from the Friedrich Ebert Foundation are a little bit like us, the diplomats. <laughs> they're, they're, they're traveling all over the place. Uh, they live in different countries. Uh, they are a little bit more political than we are. Uh, we, we need to be neutral. You don't need to be neutral. I'm happy that you're here. So, Thank you. go ahead. Well, dear friends of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, dear friends of the Mang School, dear friends of the University of Toronto, ladies and gentlemen, um, Thank you very much, Mr. Consul General, for introducing me and for being part of our event. And I, first of all, it is my, I would like to welcome you also on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. And I, I don't, uh, I will, I want to ma make sure that you understand that the Friedrich Ebert Foundation views this conference as something very important. It is our flagship conference in Canada and we we look very much forward to the discussions today, which I, we believe are very important. And uh, we also look forward to further, of course, conferences. This is the seventh conference on, on Germany, on Europe, uh, in, in Toronto at the Mang School. And of course, we look forward to the eighth and the ninth and the tenth. And I want to make that commitment here that we will continue this work. We are a political foundation from Germany. Uh, but it is very important for me to make clear we are not a party foundation, we are a political foundation. There's a big difference between that. We don't get involved in elections. We think about elections and we, we promote the importance of elections and we promote the importance of going to vote, but we don't say who to vote for. We don't campaign. We don't campaign at home and we don't campaign abroad. But we work for democracy, for participation, for solidarity, uh, in, for also participation in the economy, also participation in globalization of ordinary people, of the citizens of our countries. That is very important for the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. The Friedrich Ebert Foundation was founded in 1925, and it was the name Friedrich Ebert means a lot for social democrats, but it is maybe important to remember who Friedrich Ebert was. He was the first democratically elected president in Germany. He was elected 100 years ago, um, and uh, in a very difficult time for Germany, right after the First World War, when Germany was deeply divided, and also Europe was deeply divided. And what Friedrich Ebert tried at the time was was very difficult. He tried to build bridges over trenches, not only in Europe, but also in the German society, and tried to build a democracy. And his early death in 1925 was very, had very negative impacts on the course of German history. And so his main saying was always, there is no democracy. Uh, or democracy cannot exist without Democrats. And, uh, and we need Democrats, and so we need democratic institutions, and so that is what we are working for as the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, and we have also a very strong transatlantic component because we were re-established in, uh, well, in the post-war area after the Second World where we were, of course, not existent during Nazi rule in Germany. We were forbidden like other social democratic and labor institutions. And uh, in the beginning of, after the Second World War, we were refunded and we, I think we were one of the institutions which were important to also build democracy and rebuild democracy in Germany after the first democratic experiment in, in, the German, in Germany failed so negatively. So, and we also work globally, and very important is, of course, also the transatlantic angle of our work, and we are very proud that we are also able to work in Canada, and with you, in particular, our partners here in Toronto, that we have this conversation. So thank you very much for, uh, for having us and working together with us 
and I mean, of course, we also we 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 here we want to discuss, of course, the importance of democracy and democratic choices, and uh, and an inclusive society, a, a society that stresses not only freedom but also solidarity. And um, but of course, we also want to stress the importance of our bilateral relationship, the importance of uh, Germany and Canada uh, working together, not only on a governmental level, but also on a level of politically interested people, uh, parliamentarians, politicians, trade unionists, and citizens. That's very important to us. And Willy Brandt, who is, was the first uh, social democratic chancellor of Germany after the Second World War, and who is also very much an inspiration for our work on a daily basis, always said international relations are far too important to be left to governments alone. And when we talk about Europe that we will do later, I will also want to talk about that. that if you think about Europe, one should not only look at the intergovernmental relations and the, the elected governments, but also at the trends inside of the societies which, which are not all negative when it comes to Europe. Actually, many Europeans feel very excited about uh, the European project and uh, are willing to contribute to that project and work for that project. And I believe that's why the European elections are also not going to be as negative as has been said uh, before. But we will discuss this later. And I very much look forward to that discussion. And I wish us all a very interesting and fruitful day. And my friend, Wolfgang Schmidt, who really was looking forward to, uh, to come here and to, uh, to discuss with you in person, was stopped by uh, several um, very unfortunate events uh, which had nothing to do with politics but with the, well, the organization of, uh, of the Berlin airport and then also with the, the missed connections in in, uh, in Frankfurt, so he can unfortunately not be here, but he will be here uh, per video, so we managed to arrange that, and I'm very grateful that he, he will be here. He was already introduced, so I don't need to introduce him, but he is a, not only a senior politician, but he's also someone who is a very committed European citizen and who thinks a lot about how to move Europe forward and how to move our relationship between Canada and Germany forward. So thank you very much for being here with us today and for discussing these important topics with us. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, dear um, Knut and dear Randall, dear Consul General, um, dear friends in in Toronto, I'm really sorry and um, that I can't be, be with you. Would have loved to. Um, actually, would have preferred to be in Toronto than in Berlin at the moment because it's, um, as Randall also explained, politically not always easy at the moment in our run coalition. So a time off in a different setting would have been really appreciated. But indeed, um, and also my 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 plans to come to Toronto just for the day should show you that I'm um, really interested also in the German-Canadian relations. Unfortunately, um, it was the not so well working German-Canadian relation that made it impossible because it was a joint effort of Lufthansa and Air Canada. Um, Lufthansa was not able to get me in time to Frankfurt and then just as I approached the plane to Toronto, the doors were closed. So um, I was stuck in Frankfurt yesterday and went back uh, a bit um, frustrated. The reason for that was modern technology. Some idiot was flying a drone in the morning in Frankfurt and so they had to postpone air traffic and that has had an impact. But now I'm here and I hope that this virtual connection works a little bit better than the actual connections between Canada and Germany when it comes to flights. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about Europe and the upcoming elections. As most of you might know, 
Um, they will take place in two weeks' time, from the 23rd to the 26th of May. Um, it's nearly 40 years after the first European election, 1979, took place. And you can say they come at a very crucial time, as um, we probably all know. There is the saying, if the going gets tough, only the tough get going. And you could say in international relations, um, times are quite tough. We see the trade tensions, um, and you Canadians experience some part of it as well. Um, we see that um, Russia is um, not behaving in a way that um, we think is adequate. We see the rise of China. And of course, we see in our neighborhood in the Mediterranean um, and the Middle East, um, lots of tensions, the latest um, regarding the Iran nuclear deal. So why is Europe important in that regard? Um, I think because um, only as the European Union, we will have a saying in the future. In a world of probably 10 billion people at the midst of this century, um, even 80 million Germans can't really make a difference. But um, with 500 million as the European Union of today, and then if Brexit happens with 450 million, it's a different story. And so um, what Macron said, the president of France, um, that it is all about sovereignty, um, or as um, my boss, the vice chancellor said, we don't want to be pushed around. Therefore, you need the European Union. Many equal the uh, European Union with crisis, and there is some truth to it. Um, the Consul General mentioned uh, 2015 and the uh, massive influx of refugees, um, both to Europe and then uh, Germany, but obviously we can think about um, the Euro crisis and probably the latest um, being the Brexit. Um, Jean Monnet, one of the founders and, and, and um, fourth thinkers of the um, European Union um, once said maybe Europe really needs a crisis um, to grow and um, there's this other thing never waste a good crisis and probably that's that's what's happening so one beautiful crisis was already mentioned and that is Brexit um, Obviously, um, we as the German government, but also the German Social Democratic Party, would like to see the, U the um, uh, United Kingdom to remain in the European Union. Um, nobody, I think, can really predict what our friends uh, on the island are actually doing. You all know that now they have gained additional time uh, until October. Uh, and they will hopefully figure something out also between the government and the opposition. So the general assessment of the Brexit in the rest of the European Union is that it's not good. Um, at the same time, you could say that Brexit as a crisis somehow served its purpose as well, because the rest of the 27 member states actually united um, uh, and came up with a clear and coherent and united position. That was, if you remember, the discussion three years ago uh, when there were many fears that um, the UK uh, might serve as an example for other member states um, with um, some populist movements that were also thinking about leaving um, the European uh, Union. I would say these tendencies have gone because um, for everybody it was um, quite obvious that leaving the European Union is neither an easy exercise nor a good one. Um, maybe if it, Brexit can also be, as you will be talking about um, populism later on, um, can, can serve as an example uh, because if we look at the um, underlying reasons for Brexit, um, one could probably state that it, is, it has a lot to do with populism um, and the underlying causes of populism. So the question of identity, often related with migration, in this case a fear of many Brits um, 
with this famous saying, we want to get back control, that they were, um, let's say, flooded by migrants, especially um, uh, under the rule of free movement within the European Union. And then the second question, I think, is, has to do with this discomfort um, with globalization. So that, um, unfortunately, um, those who voted um, leave uh, confused um, the solution with the problem. So in my opinion, actually, it is the uh, European Union that is, when it comes to trade, um, the solution and comes um, to how to deal with um, globalization, then again, as I said at the beginning, uh, it makes a difference if you are uh, 500 million or if you are just a population of a little bit about um, over 60 million. So um, this discomfort with globalization, um, with challenges that this brings to the workplaces um, where um, the underlying reason for, for what happened. Um, you can see that um, the Brexit as an example where populism leads to, um, but it also has an impact on the upcoming elections. Um, the EU they just um, decided that they will participate. That's the only possibility indeed, because um, if you have an extended period until October to decide whether you want to be part of the European Union, have a, a negotiated Brexit agreement or a hard Brexit, an unregulated one, then um, you will um, be uh, in a phase where the new European a parliament um, will already be um, working. So the session starts at the 2nd of July, and that is why instead of um, 705 members, the Europeans, including um, our British friends, will now decide on the composition of 751 members of the European Parliament. Um, in Europe, and in many of our parliamentarian democracies, we have this um, tradition, as in Germany, of a grand coalition. And I obviously was a little bit tempted uh, on Randall's um, introductory remarks to answer um, some of um, his um, questions or his, um, um, to, to comment on his statements, but I think we will leave that to the Q&A and I'm happy to, to discuss uh, German domestic politics or also our international rule and also when it comes to Europe and the financial impacts. Um, but I will limit myself now to the European election a little bit. Um, so I said it's all about um, coalitions in, in many of our um, European um, member states and that's true as well for the European Parliament. Actually, there is a tradition of a grand coalition. Um, that is the model between the conservative parties and um, the social democratic, socialist and democrat parties um, at the moment. Um, if we look at the polls um, um, for the moment, we see the conservative parties, EPP, the European People's Parties, polling at 24% um, as the biggest group, losing five um, points um, compared to the 2014 elections. And that would lead to 180 of the 751 uh, seats. And then the second one would be uh, my political family, the um, parliamentary group with 20% equaling 149 seats um, due to the latest polls that we have, and also five percentage points um, below. And then the third one is, interestingly, ALDE, the liberal um, uh, party grouping um, that is polling at the moment at 10% or 76 seats, um, plus one percentage points more or less. And here's the interesting part, because the French president, Macron, 
um, decided that his movement rather than a party on Marsh will um, join ALDE and so he's partnering with the Liberal Party here in Germany. And then you have nine, eight, seven, six percent for the right wing, the populist, the greens, the left wing and some others. Um, I would say you will see again a very fragmented um, European uh, Parliament. This is nothing new. Um, uh, most probably um, uh, this is the difference um, to the last European Parliament. It will not be sufficient to have a coalition of the conservative parties and the social democratic and socialist parties, but we will rather see a um, more informal um, and more inclusive um, uh, coalition um, in the parliament. The good news is that the populist parties um, who had roughly 27% already in this European parliament will most probably, or will, I guess, not most probably, but will, um, will, will despite their presence in the public discourse, um, not be in a position um, to really have an impact. Uh, so this is also, I think, for your discussion later, one of the problems that we talk way too much about um, populist parties that at the end, uh, on the national context, have like 10 to 20 percent points, but we sometimes talk about them at, as if they were to take over government. So the impact of the populist parties will be there, but limited, also because you always see lots of differences between them. And then we will see um, the, 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 what um, Vestager, the competition um, commissioner from ALDE, um, compared to the Brexit, she said, um, what will happen there, Brexit will look like a two-piece puzzle, and that is how to actually find the leadership of the new government of the European Union. So the president of the European Commission, the president of the Council, the high representative for um, foreign affairs, and so on and so on. Given this very fragmented um, European Parliament and also a um, very fragmented landscape when it comes to political party affiliation in the 28 member states, um, it will not be easy to find um, a good package. That is why um, heads of states and governments um, just recently decided that they will immediately after the European election um, meet on the 28th of May to um, discuss whom the next um, leaders like the Commission President should be. This will be a very difficult task. Um, you have heard about um, different um, blocks and different behavior, uh, probably um, with the uh, Italian government um, adding a little bit of flavor to this landscape, but all these 28 leaders, including um, Theresa May, will need to get together and find out a compromise. The parliament will have the second saying because they will have to vote on the commission president. Uh, and here we will probably see um, kind of a um, power struggle because the parliament insists on having what we call a Spitzenkandidat, so the top of the list, um, um, and uh, they say as proud parliamentarians that the next president of the government, the commission, should be one of the Spitzenkandidaten, so the ones that led the um, lists. The mood with the uh, heads of state and government is, is quite different. They argue um, this idea of a Spitzenkandidat is not mentioned anywhere in the um, treaties of the European Union, and so they feel free to choose among the more experienced leader, maybe a um, former um, prime minister or minister um, or commissioner 
So we will see. Obviously, um, I think as a devoted social democrat that our candidate, um, Franz Timmermans from the Netherlands, is a very skilled uh, politician. He is at the moment vice president of the commission, so he has the institutional knowledge um, and um, he is a good uh, set of political skills. The Spitzenkandidat of the Conservative Party is the head of the Conservative Parliamentary Group, Manfred Weber, a German. So you can imagine that Mrs. Merkel um, now is also a friend of this idea of Spitzenkandidat because it would be her friend from the party family that would then become the commission president. I would say if you go around in Europe or in Germany and ask people about who will be the next commission president, nobody can really give you an answer. As to this um, very fragmented um, European Parliament and uh, the upcoming power game between the council, so the heads of state and government, and the parliament, it is really difficult to predict. Um, the good news is um, that elections then matter. Um, and um, this is what we have seen also in the latest election, fortunately, with a very good outcome for the progressive uh, friends in Spain, where the uh, PSOE won the latest election. Four out of five parties in the national parliament are pro-European. And the uh, best news probably was that the voter turnout um, really peaked, so 73% of the people voted because they immediately understood that this is an important election. And um, we do hope that people will also think the same about um, the European election, even though it's much more complicated and far away. That's my take on what we have to expect and will ex expect um, on Europe. Maybe one last um, uh, thing on Canada, because we tend to stress that um, we are so close and that um, we share the same values and that we are devoted multinationalists. Um, I think this is um, absolutely true. Um, I experienced that in my daily work um, at the G7 and G20 with the colleagues from uh, Canada. Um, but I also think that it is absolutely necessary in these days not only to stress um, how um, close we are and um, how similar we are, but to really engage in an exchange on that. And um, the Consul General and Randall also mentioned some of the aspects like migration, why I think there is a good possibility for a lot of fruitful exchange. Um, obviously on trade, CETA, um, the joint um, uh, agreement between the European Union uh, and Canada is now provisionally in force for a year. The European Court of Justice just ruled that the investment courts um, are in line with European regulation. And we have already seen 12 member states um, ratifying um, uh, the agreement. I hope that Germany will follow um, soon. We still have to work on that. But now after the European Court's decision, I think it's, 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 um, it, it's time. So um, that's why I think that uh, the conference um, is coming at the right time. I'm really sorry that I miss it. And I also miss the reception at um, the um, residency of the Consul General. I um, thank you very much for hopefully listening and, and understanding what I said here virtually. And I'm looking very much forward to a fruitful exchange now in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, uh, State, State Secretary Schmidt. I should say the Consul General so, so graciously thanked us, and I gracelessly forgot to thank them for their support. You're, of course, one of our sponsors. I feel like you're part of the Monk School, so I don't have to thank you independently, but you do have my apologies. Uh, we have some questions uh, coming in here, and uh, feel free to respond at any point to my provocations if, if you want to, uh, State Secretary. Uh, the first and please, Randall, um, I'm a social democrat, so I am wearing a tie, but don't call me. 
<laughs> okay, fair point. Um, uh, this is about the effect of, of uh, populists, even if they don't win the majority. So the, the question is, do right-wing populist parties need or even want, because then presumably they have to be responsible, to win government to accomplish many of their goals? And then the same question more on the, on the global level. So I think a question domestically and, and globally. So I, I would say it depends on us. So if we give them this power, then they have it. Um, and that's why I strongly argue um, that um, if we talk about populism and talk with them, do not make populism um, the issue. But let's talk about um, housing. Let's talk about healthcare. Let's talk about pensions. Let's talk also about migration. Um, let's talk about economic and social issues, but not complain that um, the guy in the TV talk show next to you is a populist, because he knows that he's a populist, and those who voted for him also know that. Um, so if we want to reduce the impact that um, populists have on public discourse, I think we should um, turn to other issues and not um, fixate ourselves um, on, on populists. On the national level, on the international level, obviously it's much more complicated. If you have a neighbor um, that is run by a populist, then you can't just avoid the topic. That's true. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is a question about the Social Democratic Party. Regardless of your view on the current Enteignungsdebatte, which is the debate about the um, expropriation of property to create more public housing. In the SPT, is there any use for the party in conducting such an internal debate publicly? And how does it impact relationships, uh, relations with the CDU, CSU within GroKo? And I think that's a reference to Kevin um, Kunitz's debate. I think he just turned 18, so we should wish him a happy birthday, uh, his intervention in the debate in Germany. So please. So I'm a former member of the executive board of the Young Socialist. I was vice president of the International Union of Socialist Youth. Um, and I'd say, as most of us who serve in the several institutions of the Young Socialist, might have said similar things when we were younger. Um, <laughs> I think what, what makes the difference here, and that makes it a bit more, more complicated, that the leader of the Young Socialist is now perceived as being a member of the leadership of the Social Democratic Party. And this has something to do with um, the fact that um, he was very effectively leading the opposition against the Grand Coalition. Um, and it has something to do with social media and the impact of social media. So if you follow social media during the time when the party was discussing whether we should in the last um, spring um, enter or not again the Grand Coalition, you probably um, had um, the impression that 80%, um, 70 to 80% were against entering the Grand Coalition. The actual referendum that we did, the, um, um, the poll that we did with our um, members had uh, quite the opposite result. So that uh, Kevin Kuhnert and his friends had one third of the votes, but 66% um, of the members of the party actually said, um, we want to do that. Um, this democratic decision didn't lead uh, to a um, situation where those in opposition um, stopped campaigning or stopped arguing and said, okay, now we have a decision, but they continued. And so Kevin Kuhner, as the leader of the Young Socialist, emerged as kind of a public figure. And um, as nowadays, you do not have to send out a press release and hope for journalists to pick it up, but you can easily tweet um, and reach um, the journalist and a, um, a broader audience, that gives you a completely new set of possibilities, even at the leader of the Young Socialists. And as um, some journalists are there, my friend Roland Nellis, I think we have to discuss about this as well, that out of a sudden, um, a, 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 let's say, in the political ranking, not so high ranking, a member um, gains such 
a, a, um, a tension so that normal people um, think that this is quite an important politician. That again makes it more difficult for the leadership um, to deal with that. Um, so it has no real impact. So it has also no real impact on the relations with the CDU. Um, obviously, they took the opportunity to um, fiercely attack the SPD and the newly elected leader of the Conservative Party um, uh, even mentioned Kevin Kudert several times. So, um, Sometimes I got the feeling that they are at the same level, um, but it shows you that that it it has an impact on um, on the discussions. Um, maybe not relating it to what Kevin Kuhner said in this more general interview, but what you can see that there is obviously a growing discomfort with the way capitalism is working. We see that in the U.S. Um, we see it in many places, and maybe that also explains why this debate resonated in, in such a way. Great. Thank you very much. We're running a little short on time, so I'll start to collect questions a little bit here. Um, one is, uh, well, the question is, are there plans to broaden German citizenship requirements to include the second generation? This information is dated if you're born in Germany to someone who has the right residence permit, you are a German citizen. That happened under the Social Democrats, one of their great achievements. So let's t turn that into a question of refugee integration. Three years earlier, how, how, how in your view is it working on the ground? Are refugees getting into jobs? Is the backlash being controlled? Um, there's a question here which um, is very good for the Social Democrats. The role, it's a big one though, the role of the trade unions in Germany and in public policy and how uh, that kind of model of coordinated capitalism differs from liberal market capitalism. And a question on Nord Stream 2. Um, why, do you, why does Berlin, sorry I'm personalizing this, why does Berlin claim this is a purely com uh, commercial issue when there's obviously a political agenda and is Berlin ignoring EU competition law with Nord Stream 2? So on, on integration, yes, I would say um, we are seeing um, a, a huge um, success. Um, I used to be, um, I used to work for the city state of Hamburg before I started here in the ministry. Um, we took a lot of refugees and I know from the ground how difficult obviously it is to make integration work. It starts with housing that now um, nearly four years um, into the, the big influx from, from, from autumn 2015, it's more about integration in the labor market um, and obviously the kids um, to go to school and to kindergarten. It's a huge effort, um, but I would say that um, overall Germany really did great. Um, there are reports on the labor market participation um, that show you that um, many of those who came in uh, and that fit in the working age are actually working, others are getting their training. Um, so overall, I would say, yes, um, um, we, we did it. Um, obviously, we are still looking at a country like Canada um, or also Israel, who has much more experience with that. Um, I would say a positive experience because we also had the Gastarbeiter in the 60s and 70s, and we were not good in integrating. But here in, in the German uh, government and in the parliament, we are constantly um, um, adjusting our laws so to both make integration work better and to be clearer on those who need to leave the country because they have no um, right in asylum or refugee status or whatsoever. So to keep um, a positive note on migration. Second question, trade unions. Um, yes, they, they have an impact. Um, I would say the um, most important thing is that uh, in our um, company law, um, there is a rule for trade unions, for example, what is called the co-determination on the boards. And um, if you talk um, to many managers, and this dates back to the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, um, they acknowledge the role of um, social partnership and also on the trade unions in their boards because this 
tends to be a more long-term um, approach with trade union representatives on the board. So not this quarterly driven um, short sighted view, but a, a, a larger perspective, um, always taking into consideration the well-being uh, of the company as well. Um, and on the political level, I would say we've seen a trend when till 2002 maybe there, there was a little bit of trade union bashing and they were perceived as those who um, hinder progress um, after the fi global financial crisis. This completely changed and we've seen a rebirth of um, social partnership and trade unions being heavily engaged um, with politics and employers organizations in, in um, managing social dialogue. And the last one, North Stream 2, because it is a private decision and um, um, we are a country that has the, had the rule of law before, before we had democracy. Um, so you could sue um, the king um, and this sometimes American friends call this legalistic approach, um, but we actually tend to obey the law and um, the European competition law um, actually has nothing to do with what is going on. I think on a geopolitical um, um, level, and that is what Germany is actually doing, we have to make sure that um, Ukraine is a, will not suffer from Nord Stream 2, which is only adding to the already existing pipeline Nord Stream 1. Um, and that is something that um, we are negotiating, facilitating both with the Russians and the Ukrainians. So the Minister of, of the Economy is actually doing that. And the main issue, I think, is that um, we also need to um, make sure that the, the revenues that the Ukrainian companies or the gas companies is getting um, from the pipeline, I think roughly um, 3 billion euro is also invested into that pipeline. So we're taking the, the geopolitical and, and, and regional uh, implications into account, but we also say this is a joint venture of private companies and there's no legal ground on the existing um, set of rules to intervene. And that is what um, Mrs. Merkel said, and that's what other parties said. Um, and, and you can then endlessly argue about um, whether there is a, a too strong dependency from the Russians. Others uh, would say that it's a two-way street, so the Russians are becoming more and more dependent on the Europeans or on Germany here as well. Um, but I think this is it's, it's a bit difficult to discuss that on a video conference. Yeah, fair enough. As I didn't, I didn't realize you you were a hamburger. I should uh, tell our Canadian friends that uh, Hamburg, in, in in addition to being one of Germany's great cities, always punches above its weight politically. Produces some very impressive national figures, on, and only the most famous of which is, of course, Helmut Schmidt. And it's a great liberal and open city, as every hamburger will tell you within the first five minutes of meeting them. <laughs> now, um, last uh, last two questions was all combined. Uh, one is about Brexit and the effects on the EU, uh, but you've already answered that question, and you've said it's actually brought the EU together. Uh, but I'll just give you, I'm afraid, the prediction. Where are we going to end up with Brexit? Question one. And uh, secondly, um, another provocation, po populism has negative connotations, where is, whereas democracy has positive ones. Aren't they uh, two ways of saying the same thing? Um, namely that the majority wins, presumably if the majority is populist, what is the difference between the two? And we'll, we'll end with those. Yeah, on the Brexit, um, indeed, I mean, I mentioned the positive one, but there's a huge number of, of negative um, um, implications, obviously. Uh, what we see is that we have a very integrated supply chain, uh, chain, ch chains between um, UK and the rest of Europe. Um, so a lot of production is going back and forward. Um, if you look at the Euro Tunnel, um, you see um, an endless stream um, of, of trucks um, going and coming from the UK with goods and products and so on. Being from Hamburg, we have the Airbus um, uh, facility 
where, for example, parts for the wings are coming from the UK. So um, obviously, if there were to be introduced um, new customs or borders that would have, um, a, can have, would have, could have a dramatic impact on the economy. Uh, that is why everybody's working so hard on avoiding a hard Brexit. And not to mention uh, the political implications that this might have on the border to Ireland, where you have a EU member uh, country uh, besides then a, a, a non-member uh, UK. Um, and populism, um, I mean, there is, there is an endless number of, of definitions. I would say the, the difference between democracy, where it is about majority, is that in a democracy, the majority respects the minority. And, um, and that is not always true with populism. So populism in itself um, very often actually uses uh, the minority um, to um, build a majority. So I would say that is, that is the, the biggest difference. And, and that's uh, why, why populism is also so dangerous. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed for a fascinating talk and excellent uh, question and answer period. So, um, uh, State Secretary Wolfgang, I expect you'll have to leave us now, but again, thank you very much for making this extra effort to uh, speak to us in Toronto, and the connection's been great. We've understood you perfectly clearly, and it was lovely to see you, and we wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Rando, and thanks to all of you, and hopefully next time then, live and in situ. Brilliant. Well, we'll move right on to our next panel, and our moderator is Shahi Curl, Executive Director of the Angus Reid Institute. Something wrong? If the, if the, uh, the participants could please take their seats. Okay, great. Uh, let's move on to our uh, next um, panel. Um, in addition to our moderator, we have two uh, absolutely fine uh, speakers, uh, one of whom uh, you met this morning, Knut Detl uh, Detlfsen, sorry, that's a challenge for me, from the Friedrich Ebert uh, Stiftung in Washington and uh, from whom you heard this morning, who was introduced this morning, and Nathan Cullen, who's a member of uh, Parliament for the New Democratic Party. He was elected in 2004, um, and he's the five-term member of Parliament for Skeena Bulky Valley in northwestern British Columbia. Uh, I won't go into lengthy introductions because that will cut into our time. Let's move straight on to the panel. All right, well, thank you, Randall. Uh, my name is Shachi Curl. I am the executive director of the Angus Reid Institute, and I will be leading us through our panel this morning. It's still morning, I think. 
we've got a couple of different time zones going on. So uh, I am based in Vancouver, British Columbia. Our uh, organization, the Angus Reid Institute, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit polling organization. Uh, we seek to uh, understand and measure public opinion on any number of issues, uh, including what Canadians think of Germany. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, from a perspective that is not influenced by government, not influenced by market forces uh, or, or other uh, outside influence. We, we try to be the folks who are straight up the middle uh, when it comes to Canadian opinion and, and fill that gap where it doesn't exist uh, in this country. So that is what we do. When you hear me um, referencing uh, data today, uh, I'm not talking about my opinion. I am actually reflecting um, uh, opinion that has been measured, uh, published, and, and you can check it out uh, on our website at angusreed.org if, if you have any skeptical moments. Um, speaking of Canada and Germany, uh, Canada loves Germany. About four in five say that they have a favorable opinion of the country, see it as a friend and ally. And uh, probably, uh, you heard a little bit about CETA earlier uh, from Herr Schmidt. Um, the last trade deal that Canadians were truly enthusiastic about and, and not particularly divided or polarized on. Um, when we look at trade with Asia now, that is increasingly fraught with issues around rights versus access to markets. I won't even get us started on NAFTA because that would uh, go go a little bit over, and uh, I think it has a new name out now anyway. I think, what are we calling it now, Nathan? You smacka? You smacka. So uh, our, 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 our trading relationship with our greatest trading partner, the United States, has obviously been a little bit fraught recently. Uh, that said, um, there are some interesting parallels occurring in terms of uh, what's happening in the United, uh, sorry, in Canada versus in the European Union these days. Uh, when we talk about populism, and that is the subject of our panel today, we're talking about madness at the polls. That's a very catchy title. I don't know how mad things are, how crazy things are, but they are unprecedented. We are heading into an election this October that in many ways will be like no other in Canada. Um, you know, two years ago, uh, I gave, uh, I, I argued for the resolution at the Travers debate. And the resolution was, be it resolved, that Canada is immune to Trump-style populism. And I thought the very notion of any nation being immune to anything would render me the winner of this debate just walking in the door. Of course we're not immune to it. Uh, but I was before a room a little bit bigger than this, and it was in Ottawa at the height of sunny ways, and it was a pretty skeptical crowd. What I would say is this. Populist grassroots movements occur on both sides, on all ends of the political spectrum. So when we talk about populism, we're not necessarily just talking about right-wing populism. The political movement to which Nathan belongs right now, the NDP, was born of a populist movement, the CCF. And what was it? It was a wholesale rejection at the time of political class, of political elitism that denied farmers the ability to get the insurance and the financing that they needed to be able to grow their crops, feed their communities, support their families. Today, we're seeing a different kind of rejection of the political class in Canada. So I see evidence of that in uh, the rise, and it is a nascent rise, of the Green Party. Uh, we saw a breakthrough by-election win just earlier this week in, uh, in British Columbia in a riding that should have been, sorry, Nathan and NDP, gimme. Um, adding to that, adding to that momentum is the mushrooming of the elections of provincial uh, representatives in British Columbia, in Ontario. If you look at Quebec Solidaire as a bit of a proxy for the Greens in Quebec, in New Brunswick, and of course forming opposition in Prince Edward Island. Um, now, people will say, well, it's two members in the House of Commons, it's a handful of MLAs, what does that really mean, what does that matter? I am reminded of the instant explosion of the Reform Party, another grassroots, 
you could say at the time, small p populist party um, in the 1990s, where people were tired of the options they had in front of them and wholesale opted for something else. So we are seeing at a time again, Canadians not very excited about the options they have in front of them, looking for new alternatives. Now concerningly, one of those new alternatives is also the People's Party of Canada, uh, led by Maxime Bernier, whose rhetoric, uh, because it's mostly rhetoric at this point, we haven't seen much in terms of policy planks, um, maybe leaves uh, some to shudder a little bit. Uh, for others, however, uh, Monsieur Bernier is speaking absolute truth to their frustrations, to their sense of alienation, to their sense of marginalization in terms of the changes that are happening in this country. We don't know a lot about where that will go as yet because they have not been truly tested in an election situation, but I would make two comments about that. The People's Party polled a fairly significant 10% when we, when we think and are dismissive of this party uh, saying, well, they've got no chance. Well, they, they showed up. They got on, on the ballot in uh, Burnaby South in a by-election. This is a very diverse, multicultural riding. The People's Party polled 10% there, largely driven by voters who were conservative, social conservative Chinese Canadians. So we must, at this point, take a moment, counter our narratives about who votes for what and why. Second of all, I expect that we will see more people paying attention and engaging with the party, with Monsieur Bernier, with his rhetoric, if he ends up being at the leaders' debate during the election campaign. And right now, the, the standard, the bar for being at that debate is if you've got a seat in the House and you're the leader of your party, you're in. He's going to be there by all, by all accounts. It will be very difficult to, to justify not having him there if Elizabeth May has been able to be there in, in past years. So where are we going? Um, we see in Canada, particularly from the outside in, a shining example of integration, of how to do immigration right, of how to do diversity and multiculturalism right. Uh, our immigrants tend to have better educations, uh, they send their kids to school, they are homeowners, they are taxpayers. Housing is not the problem. Trying to get the kids to go to school is not the problem. Um, and yet, we are seeing for the first time in 20 years a desire to see fewer immigrants come to Canada than more. We see a whopping two-thirds of the country say that it is incumbent on newcomers and minorities to do more to fit in to mainstream society. And we note that the reaction to the migration or the, or the border crossing phenomenon, which is now probably rolling into its third summer in Canada between the US-Canadian border, really alarmed a lot of Canadians. They all went, oh, because it was a new phenomenon for them. And that visceral reaction and that concern is something that crossed all party lines. New Democratic voters were as concerned about it as were liberals, as were conservatives. This was not something that polarized or cleaved along political lines. So that's running counter to some of our sunny ways narratives here at home. In terms of how we are interacting with the world, we all quite enjoyed four years ago, and by we all, I mean the majority of voters, sort of pulling this, this lever that made us feel good and release some endorphins when we heard our now Prime Minister talking about how Canada was going to be back. We like the idea of Canada being back or being there or being on the world stage. We were tremendously embarrassed by our, our former Prime Minister in terms of his performance on the world stage. But beyond rhetoric, Canadians are kind of cheerful deadbeats when it comes to our uh, international obligations. Do we spend the 0.7% of GDP on foreign aid? No, we do not. Do our people want to bring that spending up? No, they do not. It's about the same on our NATO defense spending. We have commitments to our NATO allies. We're not even close. Canadians don't care. So within that context, um, we are set to, I think, see some, some interesting shifts 
uh, if the numbers hold out, and of course, I, I'm not going to take out a snow globe and shake it around and prognosticate as to where things will land in October. That's totally how I do it. I just get up in the morning and I say, whose day am I going to ruin today? No. Uh, the numbers are the numbers, but the numbers we know change. Campaigns do matter. Caveat, caveat, caveat. That said, um, I think that, that this will be, as I began, a really unprecedented campaign in terms of the fracturing, uh, in terms of the rejection of the political class, and I think in terms of the, the, uh, the challenges to some of the assumptions we have about ourselves and indeed what some of our international friends and allies may have about us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. Yeah, uh, Nathan, I'm, I'm going to come to you from your perspective as a, uh, as, as a, a long-time Canadian politician. He's been at it for a while. I'm not suggesting he's old, I'm just saying. <laughs> and we'll go from there, and then Knut, I would love to hear from you. Um, thank you, and uh, first of all, I want to say a, a great thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Um, I somewhat suspect your judgment in inviting me to this particular topic, but I am grateful for your, uh, for your welcome. I guess I am the uh, political class that Canadians are rejecting. Uh, well, this, I, I announced just a, a month ago that I was not re-offering for the next election, so you can't reject me. I quit. <laughs> um, so there. The, uh, this is a, a, a fascinating topic for me, and this is such an interesting place in which to hold it. I, I grew up in Toronto and would walk through this campus as a high school student, wondering if I could ever get into these august halls. And I, and I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't qualify. Um, but I ended up here anyways. Isn't life strange? I represent northwestern British Columbia. I moved out to the west coast as as quite a few Torontonians do uh, when, when you get a taste of Western living. And so I, I see this question of populism perhaps from a, a somewhat uh, different angle than some of my colleagues in the House, the, the elite, the political class, uh, who should be rejected. Um, the, the notion for me as a, as a, a I grew up working class in this city. Uh, I would walk through uh, these neighborhoods and the annex and other places and wonder how, how this all worked and how it could work for me or wasn't for me and my family. Um, my mom was a single mom cashier at, at Dominion Foods, if you remember that great store that, that Conrad Black uh, did something to. Um, the, and, and then eventually moved to the West Coast in northwestern British Columbia. I guess what I would offer is the, uh, the movement of foot, as has been described by Sachi and our previous speakers, is real. And I, have you ever seen those um, um, warnings on how to deal with a bear if you encounter a bear in the woods? Canadians aren't, especially urban Canadians, are never totally confident as to how to handle it. Is it, is it play small? Is it be big? Is it walk towards? Is it run away? No, don't run. Climb the tree, run downhill. We're, we're never really sure how to handle a bear encounter. I find sometimes dealing with the political class when talking about populism, especially from the right, very similar panic as to how do you approach a right-wing populist? What should you do? Should you scream at them? Should you ignore them? Should you try to talk over them? I would uh, suggest that all of those options are bad options. That the place that I represent and the people who would perhaps fall into some of those tendencies, fear of immigration, skepticism of the international trade rules and whether the economy is generally working for them or is rigged against them, Ignoring them, shouting over them, um, calling them uh, ridiculous and racist generally doesn't win them over to any kind of a conversation. And that has been the tendency both here in Canada and I would argue the United States, where both of the major parties, in response to a populist, a disenfranchised movement of resentment, told them to be quiet. In the, in the Rust Belt states, and Sachi and I did a little tri trip just prior to the last US election, and the bubbling up, the welling up of misinformed fake news, all the rest, was tapped into very successfully by a very cagey, if unprincipled, politician in the form of Donald Trump, who not only ran against Democrats, ran against Republicans, ran against the entire system quite successfully. And it wasn't just Cambridge Analytica and a Facebook algorithm that was his success. It was a message. It was oversimplified answer to very complicated problems. And the elite said, that is a very oversimplified answer to a very complicated problem. 
and Trump just tweeted and tweeted and tweeted. So uh, I think there is a, a certain smugness sometimes, I think, with us as Canadians. We like to humble brag a lot, as the kids say. How wonderful are we that we are open, we are into pluralism and diversity, and we don't have an immigration problem. Oh, really? When 25,000 Syrians were, re were accepted into this country, our system barely maintained itself. When 40,000 irregular uh, refugees crossed into the border last year, the Auditor General's report of this past week showed us with a system unable to handle the effect of that. And to a German politician, 40,000 refugees, 40,000 irregular passing into Croatia or Germany or Austria, Tuesday. That's Tuesday. Tuesday. So that, that allows us a certain smugness in Canada to say, well, we're better at it. Well, maybe, but we don't have the proximity as the Americans do in the South, as the Europeans do to their South as well, to the sheer numbers of the problem. So I think we should be always careful in our, um, if we're talking about elite, that Canada, I love this country more than any other place on earth. It's given me and my immigrant family from Ireland opportunities that were impossible to imagine in our home country. Yet, are we vulnerable to this phenomena, this reality? Well, yes, it depends. It depends on the response from the political class, from the elites, from the folks where the system has worked out generally well for the past number of generations, institutions like this. And I would all, all I would suggest is that we should be unsettled by this question. If we feel settled, if we feel comfortable, if we feel at ease, then we have a problem. For those of us that believe in the idea of Canada, as uh, one former politician said, Canada works well in practice, but not in theory. The theory of Canada is terrible. Who would come up with this idea? French, English, this indigenous thing, sitting just north of this behemoth. It shouldn't work yet generally has for most people. Yet if that leads to a sense of elitism or smugness, then there is in that danger. Because these sentiments of the system being rigged, of it being fundamentally unfair, is a real sentiment within working people and certain groups of people in this country. And if we don't give them an outlet, if we don't offer them some solutions to the fears they have about the future for themselves and their kids, then they will turn to somebody who offers them a simple solution to complex problems. That is what I would offer. Thank you, Nathan. Knut. He gets applause. Wow, well done. You must have said something really good. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. And I'm now not sure what I'm supposed to answer. I mean, I cannot really comment on the elections in Canada. Uh, but I, I have encountered a bear in Canada. So I have experience with that. Yeah, this is, this is how I'm going to start. Like, uh, I'm very happy to be back in Canada. But actually, this is my first time now being back in, the, in Toronto in the capacity I have now, like being the a representative for the Friedrich Ebert Foundation here in, in North America. I don't only represent the foundation in the US, but also here in Canada. But I visited Canada because Germans have a very strong fascination with Canada. We also, we like Canada. And so when I was finishing high school, I went for an eight week trip to Canada, started here in Toronto, but I also went to British Columbia and I went canoeing there and there, I suddenly, my friend said, look, there's a bear behind you. And I said, no, come on, there's no bear behind me. They were, How should a bear come here? And there actually was a bear. Well, I just stayed calm and I talked to the bear. And <laughs> I, I, had, I had also read all kinds of instructions what to do, but I, those I couldn't remember in the moment. <laughs> and I fa figured that we basically, we have to move in different directions and then he will probably eventually go away. Well, the bear went, go, uh, did go away, but, uh, um, but obviously, I mean, we, we, when we talk about, we want to talk about different elections, so also about the European elections and, uh, and populism in, in Europe and, uh, and what this, this means generally. I very much agree with the fact that, uh, that I mean, pop, the people that elect populists, of course, do this for, for many reasons, but usually for real 
uh, grievances they, that they feel, uh, and that also for reasons that they feel political, if you call it elites, but that many that the politics and institutions don't pay enough attention to the problems that they have. And of course, our societies, our modern societies in Europe, and Europe is very diverse, has very uh, different levels of income, of wealth, or poverty, and, and there are real problems in Europe in every given country, but also internally, and these populists try, of course, to, to they, 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 when we talk about populism in Europe, it is really right-wing populism we are talking about. It, it, that's what it is about. And it is a problem for democracies because they challenge the basics of democratic discourse because they don't argue on facts, they don't argue on the real problems, but they rule or they, they work on fears and they try to, um, well, they, they try to, of course, use these fears for their purposes in gaining support and they use this very effectively also in, in social media and they are much better at that than all the democratic pro-European parties. But nevertheless, I mean, as Wolfgang said, and I very much agree with that, and it's actually also something that Olaf Scholz, the Vice Chancellor of Germany, has written already in an essay uh, six years ago, it is very important to challenge the right-wing parties, they are not only populist or right-wing extremists, on the issues. Because usually, though, they don't offer any solutions on the real questions that people have, which is, of course, uh, education, the future of their children, housing, pensions, and so on. And this is something where, they, where we can challenge them. And they, before I mentioned Kevin Kühnert, uh, I, I actually don't see him as a problem because he's actually a very good communicator for social democracy and speaks for younger people. And I'm, you know, I think actually in social democracy, we would need more uh, younger uh, representatives in our parties because uh, and, and speaking for them and he like just four weeks ago he was in a very popular talk show in Germany uh, and it's not prime time but it's a time where many people watch talk shows at 11 o'clock at night and he actually called a, a senior right-wing politician on how he has no solutions and it was very obvious to the public. That <coughs> video went actually viral. And it's part of the reason why Kevin Kuhnert, uh, the young, he was mentioned before, the young social democrat is so popular because he is a good communicator on real issues. And at the same time, he uses for his purposes uh, populist measures to popularize, uh, well, left-leaning ideas, how do we deal with capitalism and the injustices of, that capitalism creates? And I mean, these are justified questions, I think. And that's why I think, as social democrats, uh, if we want to counter, uh, we, we probably need to be a little addressing the problems that people feel that, the, yeah, the system is not working for everybody. That's pretty obvious. And that's something we have to um, we have to be the spokespeople for ordinary people who struggle every day to make ends meet. And, and that's what we have to do. And there, of course, one has to be a bit more populist. But I, one thing is what, what's very important when we think about the European elections. Just two points I want to make there. The European elections are probably not the most important elections in 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 Europe because people, the participation in these elections is relatively low and it's actually unfortunately dropping. If you look at the first European elections we had in 1979, the participation was still with 61%. In the last European election we had 42% participation, so a huge drop. This, I think this year the uh, participation is gonna pick up, but it's not gonna go back to 60%. So you have, this is why the, the results are also a little bit distorted because you, it tends to favor, uh, let's say, parties that are a bit more extreme and then social democratic party being center left and Christian Democrats being center right 
don't do so well in such elections. And, uh, but um, at the same time, you have also popular movements in some countries, like Poland, which is right now a very problematic country, which are very pro-European and which are gaining support. So you have also a wave of pro-European parties which are gaining support. So that's a positive sign that you also have. And this is, which also deserves attention, I think, because we always try to uh, tend to look at the negative trends, but there are actually also some positive trends. And the other positive trend is that people actually do care more. That's why you will see a re reversal, I think, in the participation. Do care more about these elections altogether, seeing them at all as something meaningful. And overall, I mean, an election is, should be seen as something positive. It's a festival of democracy. I mean, it's what makes, makes this whole thing tick. And the other thing which will come out of it, and both candidates have promised that, the conservative one and the social democratic one, that they're going to strengthen the European Parliament, which after all is until now a relatively weak parliament in comparison to national parliaments. So that's also a positive development. So that's a few th positive things I want to leave uh, about the European election. Uh, but we can, of course, discuss uh, how right-wing populism in Europe uh, well, is harmful or not harmful, or is a real issue or not a real issue? I will, well, if you want to talk about let's that. Let's talk about that. Um, so I, I would offer the hypothesis, and then I would put it to the two of you. Um, you know, Canada, I see, is more of a state nation than a nation state, right? We're always trying to figure out what is Canadian culture. Indeed, one in four Canadians don't really think we have a common culture. It's kind of US culture. Um, so what, what often becomes the hinge or the crux of a sense of alienation in this country tends to be regional alienation. Quebecers feel isolated and alienated and at times have talked about feeling humiliated. Right now we're dealing with a, a very strong movement in Western Canada, which sort of that cycle turns about every 20 years with people saying, well, hell no, we're tired of Ontario and Central Canada East deciding everything and deciding what our, what our social, economic, and cultural values should be. Um, in Germany, is it the same sense of regional factionalism? Is it more of a cultural sense of alienation? What is driving those grassroots movements in Germany relative to Canada? Well, first of all, I mean, right-wing populism is not very strong in, in Germany. I mean, overall, it is, it is, I mean, altogether, it's 15% that the alternative for Germany has. In comparison to other European countries, that is not very strong. And yes, it is very- In comparison to Canada, people would be lighting their hair on fire. So everything is relative. Yeah, well, as, as ever, well if t t 15 years ago, we would have, I would have th uh, said it's impossible that you will have a party like the alternative for Germany for Germany and it was it, it is obviously it is the political discourse has changed um, and this party runs of course um, runs very much uh, at the end of the day on racism yeah? and on, on anti-migrant sentiment and very much in particular on uh, an uh, an anti-Islam um, campaign. I mean, not campaign, sentiments, but they also campaign like that. Their main campaign slogan is don't let Europe become Arabia. Uh, and they were, of course, uh, strengthened uh, by the fact that we had uh, a, a, a huge influx of refugees, which is a very complex uh, story. I, I always don't like to call it a crisis because it was something that could have been uh, well anticipated and for many reasons was not as much anticipated as it was. And the, and the other thing is, the other uh, reason why they thrived and are still thriving is that there was a sentiment in particular in Germany, you know, that Germany is being taken advantage of by other European nations, which is objectively wrong 
but it's a sentiment and it had to do with the with the crisis in the financial crisis of the European Union and that there was a fear that Germany would have to foot, uh, pay the bills for other um, countries. Now, um, it is regional, yes, the, the, the party is stronger in certain regions, uh, it is stronger uh, and it is driven um, and the, it is but it is very much driven by these negative sentiments. And, uh, and of course, there are people that feel, regions that feel that politics don't, or politicians don't pay enough attention to their problems. But one has to be also, re I mean, realistic that it is these very negative um, drivers that, 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 that fuel this party. But my, uh, my sense, political sense, is that actually the alternative for Germany, and you can now observe that in the next uh, polls, has um, pretty much reached its, its, its limits. And because there are many Germans that feel, of course, and that is the huge majority of German citizens that feel that the discourse that this party has brought into our public discourse is shameful, is uh, something we don't, we don't like to hear, and they don't speak for us, for the majority of Germans. And so there is also a negative uh, poll that people will never vote AfD, which is around 80%. So I think the party will never rise above 20. Yeah? And, and in a way, if you want to see it, it has, of course, energized the political discourse in Germany. You know, it makes the possibility to talk about problems in a very energized way. So maybe that's also this cri political crisis that the AfD represents uh, by having this very ugly discourse, which is in particular, I mean, in Germany, you feel highly uncomfortable because it's also, they they are, of course, in denial uh, with parts of um, Germany's uh, most darkest history. Yeah? And that is a big problem for us, that they call this culture that we have developed in dealing with our past a burden. You know, I believe, and the majority of Germans believe, that actually dealing with the experience of political dictatorship, dealing with mass murder, is a very important part of German democracy that we have built over a long period of time. And it was a very painful, difficult political struggle in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, until now. And they challenge all that. Okay. So. That's, that's, that's part of it, so it's, that's, it's a bit, I know it's a bit too long answer now that I gave, but uh, if you look at the German populace, it has this, uh, this part is, is often overlooked, but in the internal struggle, it, it, it is, I think, very, very important. All right, so Nathan, a lot to unpack there. A lot, of, a lot of background, a lot of deep, deep background in terms of some of the drivers in Germany. Um, compare and contrast that to what we're seeing in Canada. I, th I think <clears throat> Canada doesn't hold national elections. We hold a series of regional elections, and they all feed into whoever becomes prime minister and, and, and govern. Quebec is debating right now, right now, the, uh, the law to decide whether somebody can wear a veil or not in public, a yarmulke in public, as if, uh, while performing a public service job. It was a very, uh, and that, that, that initiative, that energy has come from, I would suggest, the center and the right and parts of the left in Quebec. I don't think it's, and which, which dramatically challenged my view of what Quebec is as a province, as a people, more global thinking, more uh, pluralistic in their thinking, more progressive in their thinking. Yet it has been very popular for politicians in Quebec to promote the idea that the real trouble with what's going on with Quebec is is uh, the entrance of Muslims into Quebec culture, which is patently, empirically, rationally false. Irrationally, it, it resonates with some 
in Quebec who have other fears that are deep-seated and historical fears as well. Um, Jason Kenney was recently, the newly uh, elected Premier of Alberta was recently in Ottawa and suggested that if a certain bill on a, a, a tanker exclusion zone in northern British Columbia were to pass, then Alberta may well likely secede from the country which is laughable and a very irresponsible and stupid thing to say, in my opinion. Because <clears throat> the separation anxiety is higher in Newfoundland than it is in Alberta and always has been and forever will be. It, it feels to me, though, that Michael Lewis, the fellow who wrote um, Moneyball and Wall Street and a couple of very provocative books, has a, a new podcast out and it, in, in which he goes through a series of uh, 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 interviews with people who are trying to set the rules, referees, are referees of society. And what happens when you no longer have faith in the referees? Whether it comes from the right or it comes from the left or as a general population, what happens then? Well, then things break down. If we no longer trust the banks or the government or pollsters, heaven forbid, or, or, or politicians in general, then the space gets created. I've, I've often thought in Canada, maybe this is also true in Germany, I don't know, that we don't tend to elect governments, we just throw the bums out. And then afterwards we ask, who did we elect? The Premier of Ontario was elected without a platform I, that I could find. I don't know if anyone found one. And, and, and for those of us that don't ascribe to his type of politics, we more than scratch our heads, we ball up our fists and say, what are people thinking, right? How could we let this happen? Whose fault is it? Let's go down the list. It's the media, it's the... I, I, I've been curious, and I want to spend more time on this, and I'll finish here to your question. I think, oh, by the way, I've shaken my snow globe. I think we're headed to a minority parliament in the fall, which I don't think would necessarily be a bad thing, because a full-blown reactionary vote against the current government and its current policies may lead to some unintended consequences, as we've seen before when we throw the bums out. This is a new Democrat talking, but I'm a soon-to-be recovering politician, so I can speak, <laughs> speak more freely about partisan interests. Because I think that it, it has fractured. Some of the coalition that Mr. Trudeau assembled has been fracturing, and the pollsters tell us has fractured. Will it reassemble in the next six months? Ah, good. It may not. Um, and I have lived through minority parliaments and enjoyed them quite a bit. And I've lived through a few majority parliaments, both liberal and conservative, and I've enjoyed them much less, not just as a new Democrat, but as a parliamentarian, because power is diffused. And, and this is where I'll go. That when power concentrates over time, it is a feeding ground for corruption and rationalized corruption. Well, we had to do this really awful thing that self-served, but because of the larger project. I think minority parliaments, I'm a fan of proportional voting. I think of, of ways to express ourselves democratically as voters that are more accurate than the system that we have, because one can gain a majority government in this country with 37% of the voting public, which is about 25% of the adult public. When you go into a minority situation, you diffuse power in parliament. It isn't just the prime minister's office who's running things. And I know this, empirically I can show it to you, and I actually think it actually can produce um, more progressive, certainly, legislation and more lasting uh, programs. Our, basically, our national health care system, our social welfare system, our flag and our anthem all came out of minority parliaments. All came out of some uh, dividing up a little bit of the power and maybe being a bit more responsive to what the electorate were expressing rather than what the Prime Minister's office is able to determine what voters want and need to answer the challenges that they face. So I'm, I, even though I am uh, decided to step away from politics, I'm quite hopeful in this never waste the crisis, slightly chaotic feeling. Um, I, would, I would just say uh, yelling at the bear, ignoring the bear, um, telling the bear it's not a bear are all stupid ideas. And talking to the bear is not a bad idea. Um, trying to reason a little bit and maybe walking away if the bear does seem angry. Um, but engagement is probably a better idea than, uh, than non-engagement. Okay, so hold those thoughts on democratic reform because I am going to come back to that and talk to the two of you about that. Uh, Nathan, first I want to 
come back to you and then to Knut on the impacts, if any, the influence of any, uh, on the political situations in Canada and Germany based on what we're seeing coming out of the United States. So to what extent has Trump-style populism pushed uh, populist movements? Um, or were they always just there and latent? And now there is a perhaps a bit more of a permission to speak out because we're seeing it at other places. So to what, to what point has it been a, a push or a pull situation? And to what extent has it been, oh, we, we now have something that we can identify with and we're going to come out of the woodwork because it's okay to do that. So for, the, for this conversation, we're assuming when we say populism, we mean right wing, yeah, Trump alt, style, alt right. Okay. Alt, yeah. It's a little hard for me because populism, the idea of it was what created Medicare in Canada. Yeah, no, we talked about that. And so that's yeah. a frustration for me, but I'm not going to spend a lot of energy and time trying to rescue back the term. I see New Democrats do this all the time on socialism. We need to steal back the idea. It's not Don't communism, it. and I say, wonderful, do it. Spend, spend your time doing that. Um, so if, if I'll, I'll give you one example. So recently, just in the last month or so, the government somewhat quietly in the middle of an omnibus bill changed the refugee laws in Canada. It, not positively, I would argue, in terms of if you're a refugee fleeing persecution. The laws became more strict. And Bill Blair went on television and said, the reason we're doing this is because of the right-wing fear campaign that has responded to the refugee situation, particularly in Quebec. And it was a good open admission in the moment where I would argue bad policy is coming out of a real thing. And the government of the day, who three years prior was tweeting welcome to Canada, is now tightening and ratcheting down on refugee. And we can debate, we can debate the policy as to the merits of it. I can, and the refugee uh, folks in this country who advocate for refugees can argue quite articulately why the changes were bad. My, my point is not to argue the policy, is to argue where the motivation for the change came from. And the motivation from the change, uh, for the change did not come from a prototypical liberal progressive initiative. It came out of response of the campaign that had been run against refugees in the country. And that's not me, that's the government minister in charge of it saying so. So that would be an example. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's probably other examples of the so-called Trump effect. I have great in, in an almost bottomless sympathy for our government in trying to just deal with Trump. I, I don't imagine how hard that is. Um, he's, he's got America bought into a really bad speculative land deal that's going to collapse at some point because all of his land deals collapse. Um, and yet he is, he is an untrustworthy and unreliable partner to try to negotiate with, and we try to speak past him often to Congress. That's how bad it is. <laughs> we have to go right, right to Congress, and they're the most reliable source um, as a partner right now, but that's the reality. So, and what his effect is, I'm not sure. I think in some ways Trump has been sometimes helpful to our government because you know, this glass of water looks great standing beside Donald Trump. So our prime minister looks incredibly reasonable because he is in comparison to the person with the extraordinarily long tie, which no one has ever explained to me <laughs> why. Has, has anyone got any theories? Okay. I just, I've, it's always been a curiosity to me. Is it a, is it a, it's a, it's a compensation thing is one theory my wife says. But um, in, in, in order to, to, to contrast this fine politically, but in order to have such a vital traded partner be so irrational and so unfaithful, I don't, you know what I mean, unfaithful that way, um, is very difficult for our government. And I, I suspect they're often doing the best that they can. Um, can you, you talked a little bit about what's driving some right-wing populism in Germany. Has, to what extent are Germans sort of looking at what's been happening in the United States and either saying, aha, among those right-wing populists saying, well, we're not alone, or has it given them voice, or is Trump even on the radar in terms of, of the right-wing populist growth that we've seen in the US and then its reflection on the world stage and in international discourse, or are, 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 are they bemused by it or, or what? Or is it like, hey, we have a friend now. What's, what's going on in terms of the way the movements have, have influenced or impacted each other or not? 
I don't think I can answer all the questions you've asked. Like, uh, because and you're going to do it briefly. I, so I, <laughs> but I want to say one thing is uh, one thing that is very uh, clear. You know, Donald Trump, as a phenomenon, as a person, as a president, is highly unpopular in Germany, and with the German public. Um, if you look at the, since you're a fan of of polls. Uh, of course, they are very good. There's very good data on that. Um, like the 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 view of the German public um, of the United States of America has completely changed uh, in the last years since Donald Trump came, became president. While before, most Germans had a very positive view of the United States in general, also and an even more positive view of the American president, which was Barack Obama, very positive of the United States and even more positive of the president, who Germans liked very much for many reasons. The opposite is now the case if you look at the views of the German public. Now the German public has a very negative view of the United States as a world actor, as a leader, as a, they even see the United States as a threat to global security. Um, that's actually a study that the Friedrich Ebert Foundation is, uh, did that is very uh, shocking, actually, the results, and an even more negative result when it comes to the president himself. Like 90% of Germans think he's a, a very negative uh, political figure and, and distrust. So that's why you cannot win much with Donald Trump in Germany. Uh, on the opposite, he, I would say, I mean, Donald Trump is, is energizing uh, the pro-European uh, forces in Europe. But not Donald Trump alone. It's also Erdogan. Mm. It is uh, Putin. Uh, because what is new? And, but, but Donald Trump is a big problem. Uh, and and the, the, not only Donald Trump, his administration. Because Germany is a very close ally to the United States of America. And to us, the transatlantic alliance is strategically, politically, and also emotionally important. In particular, if you, uh, if you live in Berlin as a citizen. And so it's not something abstract. It's something very real. Now, you have a president of, of the United States of America who publicly uh, says that he doesn't trust this country, nor this alliance, uh, nor the European Union, and sees all of that as a problem. Now, that is a problem. And that is not only a problem for uh, the chancellor and political representatives. It's a problem for the every German citizen that reflects on his situation politically in the world. And so you can sit in a hotel somewhere in Germany, and on the next table, people will discuss American politics as if that was their politics, mm. because it affects us. It's real. It changes the world we live in. It changes, not, it changes trade relations. It changes how we conduct international business, and Germans do have an opinion on that, and not only the chancellor. And so he does, and, and politicians that operate like him, of course, create an, 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 an atmosphere of insecurity, and they also manage somehow, through their politics, to that people trust less in political institutions. And that, ironically then, of course, strengthens then again right-wing populists because that's what they thrive on, that people don't trust in the political institutions anymore. So indirectly, he does help them, even though he is so highly unpopular. But he is not alone. Orban, Viktor Orban, our homegrown European uh, right-wing uh, populist, is also a big problem. And then when we talk about the European elections, you know, that's what is, is very important to see. Like, even if you have a few more right-wing populist MPs in the European Parliament, they are not as big a problem as right-wing 
populist governments that uh, have a winner takes it all mentality and don't want to cooperate, like Viktor Orban, like uh, Salvini from Italy, and others. Okay. Uh, questions from the audience. I'm going to collate some of these. Some of them we've touched on, so we may not get time. I'm going to treat this as a rapid fire round, so we're going to try and get through as many as possible. Nathan, first one to you. Uh, quick response from Knut on uh, secularism. So we're talking about Bill 21 in Quebec, uh, proposed ban on religious wear if you are a public servant, particularly in a management space. Uh, this has been posited as one way to keep populism down because it forces everyone to it. I am not positing this, but this, is, this is, has been posited. Uh, effective or not? Um, and uh, and Knut, I'll ask you when you answer to sort of speak to the uh, experience in Germany relative to France, where, where secularism is something that's that's been a, a large debate as well. Nathan, yeah, you I, first. I, I hope no one misunderstands my early comment. I don't think appeasement is actually a strategy. I, it, we tried it in the past, mm. and it's not a good idea. I think understanding where the, the source of the fear is, et cetera, et cetera, I think conversation, understanding, but appeasement to say, Yes, we hear your fears, and those fears are correct. Therefore, we are going to ban certain few people from participating fully in society and expressing themselves as their place of faith in, in the way that they wish to, without imposing anything on anybody else, not proselytizing, not converting. So no, I don't, I don't uh, agree with that. I understand someone trying to argue it, um, but I disagree. Give us the European perspective. Well, that is a big debate in Europe. I have my personal view on that, I'm, I, and that's the same. I have to say exactly the same view. I mean, you cannot, I mean, we have to be in an open society. We have to work stronger on integration. In public, in Germany in particular, we would need more people that do have a migrant background in, in public office, uh, in, in general, in, in, in all public uh, services. So that's uh, actually, that's what I think we need to push politically. Okay. Democratic reform, electoral reform, uh, questions around uh, how this has an effect on both the, the benign populism of, of, of progressive grassroots movements and also on, on perhaps the, the right-wing aspects of populism. So in Canada, just by way of quick background, uh, we have had a prime minister who ran on the idea of saying that this coming election would be one where people voted under a proportional representation system. That was abandoned in, in other jurisdictions provincially in British Columbia. We had a referendum. The third one on the same idea, which was overwhelmingly rejected. Uh, very briefly, uh, among the many arguments for and against, some people say it will uh, lead to better, more direct democracy, more people feeling less alienated. Others saying it opens the door and windows to populist parties uh, across the board. Briefly, both your takes on that. Uh, in, in terms of the last piece you said, the, the fear component of it, if you go to a proportional system, then the pirate party rules the world, I think is uh, stupid. I, I don't think there's any evidence for it anywhere that I've seen in the world. I, I suppose all of this is about um, customer satisfaction. <laughs> I want people to be able to go into a ballot box, vote for what they want rather than just what they're most afraid of, and then pick from lesser evil options. So-called strategic voting is how we, we term it here in Canada. I want people to see their vote reflected in Parliament. And I want our Parliament to become more reflective of the country just by who's there. Under Stephen Harper's majority, it was 25% of the Parliament was women. Under Justin Trudeau's majority, 26% of the Parliament is women. At the current pace, we will hit parity in 87 years. And it is not reflective um, amongst other groups as well. So we, I don't think there's any silver bullets. I don't think there's a perfect voting system out there that answers everybody's needs in all circumstances. I just think we need to evolve it, and we missed an opportunity to do that, and that's lamentable. Um, and it's somewhat ironic now that some of my liberal friends are saying we, the fear campaign is that Andrew Scheer could win a majority with just 37% of the vote. And I say, you don't say, really? Is that a fact? I had no idea. Um, so it, it's, I, I think it was due time, and, and maybe it's time will come in another form. Uh, I think Quebec, ironically, is some of their bad legislation is also moving. Quebec will have a proportional voting system in all likelihood by the next time they go to the polls.
they're moving a law by fall, I believe, to pass before Christmas. Um, Canadians in referenda, the voters who have participated, overwhelmingly rejected uh, options for proportional representation in this country, in part because change is different and scary and unknown. Uh, you don't advocate for any one political party, but you have a proportional system. What would be the thing that you would say to, to Canadian voters around what they should be mindful of or aware of or, or, or words that they, they would want to know about uh, the difference in systems? Well, I mean, I would say for, for, for Germany, for the Federal Republic of Germany, the proportional voting system has worked well. And, uh, but, uh, but it is for a German, it is of course <laughs> not correct to comment on the voting system of another country, I would always say. So I can only say for the, in the German context, the proportional voting system has worked well. At the same time, of course, it has led to a certain, over the last 10 years, to a certain fragmentation uh, of the parliament, which will make it more difficult uh, in the future to form a government. Very good. Uh, staying with you, lessons that Canadians can learn from Germany on Refugee migration is, I believe, what it says. Refugee migration, so as opposed to uh, government-sponsored immigration. Um, or okay. let me put it a different I, yeah, way: Are there lessons? Say, yeah. Are there lessons for Germany to learn from the way that Canada does it? Yes, of course. I think you are, you, well, we can learn. I think uh, Germany can, or not only Germany, I mean, in general, I think for Germany, for Europe, the whole question of migration and integration is a very crucial one. And it's, it's, it's very important to tackle it politically and not ignore it politically. That is, I would, in my opinion, one of the mistakes that not only my party, but also all. Um, democratic parties have done in Germany that we were not um, strong enough on how we're gonna um, generally do migration policy and how we're gonna do deal with migrants and I mean one of the strengths uh, one of the strong points the uh, it was mentioned before by the consul general uh, of Germany was under Gerhard Schröder who was in my opinion a very good political leader was that he said, all right, we're going to change Germans, uh, Germany's um, migration, um, no, citizenship law that made it easier for people to become German if they came from somewhere else. And that is very, in my opinion, that is very good for Germany. And, it's, it's, and, and we need to further work on that to make integration efforts Real And there, of course, I believe we can learn a lot from Canada, where uh, integration works overall better uh, than in Germany. And we are very interested in that. And there is a strong interest in that. So, but I mean, at the same time, that it is, of course, that we need to talk about the different levels of migration. And uh, one level is the organized migration. The other level is refugees that you have, uh, for which are asylum seekers and which are under international law you have to accept and should accept. And then you have, of course, a, a whole, uh, a, a huge group that migrated into Europe and into Germany, uh, which is completely uncontrolled migration. And which we do need to control somehow and tackle. And that's, it's very difficult to do that uh, with the geographical situation that we're in. And obviously Canada is in a completely different uh, situation uh, and has different ways to, um, to control that with, that we cannot have. Well, and we have I, these things called oceans yeah, and the oceans, Arctic yeah. Circle. Uh, yes. And, but at the same time, if I may something of, say something, of course, from a European perspective where we have to deal with, with refugees that come for various reasons to, to Europe, and, and obviously uh, that will not stop, 
I mean, it is, of course, a little bit disappointing uh, that, uh, that, that the numbers in North America are so small. And, 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 but we can, of course, not say what you, what you should do, but of course it would be desirable if, if, if the burden sharing there could be a little bit more equal. Yeah? And because obviously we do have a real refugee, we have real crises in the world, Syria being one of them, and it, it, to my knowledge it hasn't gone away, and it doesn't look like it's not going to go away. We have millions of people sitting in very difficult situation in Jordan, in Turkey, Lebanon, and, and we have to, and we need a com common effort to deal with this, not only by taking them in, but also there, because the situation there, if you have ever been there, you really feel like that we need to do something about that. And that also means that we need to strengthen the UN agencies that work on these, uh, work with refugees. That is really something that our governments uh, need to do because the Americans fail us there, you know, I mean, the, the under the current administration. Okay, uh, I'm getting the wrap it up sign. I had one more for you, Nathan, and I know that you are an efficient question answerer, so we're gonna get it done very quickly. I know Randall's head is about to explode, sorry. Um, Major appearances of right-wing populism in both Europe and Canada, as well as the U.S., this is, this is from one of our uh, audience members, seem to be most pronounced during epochs which have uh, significant elements of society who feel alienated by an economic system based on regressive taxation and a shrinking middle class. Now, I would say this. Yeah, he's all happy. This is a softball. But I, I, I'm going to say this. We have had times of a shrinking middle class and a growing middle class and regressive taxation and more progressive taxation that have swung a little bit back and forth depending on who's in power in this country. So are we seeing a rise in right-wing populism in this country as a result of economic policy or is it other stuff? Just after uh, Trump was the declared the nominee for the Republicans, his so-called economic advisor, we didn't know that he didn't really have economic advisors, was asked, you know, why are people feeling so discontented? Because the numbers are so good. And he said, well, people are feeling terrible about the economy. And the reporter said, yes, but the numbers show the economy doing better. And he just walked right over it and said, people don't feel it. I don't know why you keep asking me this question. Canada's job report out today, one of the best job reports since we've been taking job reports, is important because you have your facts, and you have to address the sentiment and the feeling underneath. And I think that's where we, sometimes we fail people, is to say your feelings of economic insecurity, and that insecurity for your children, and opportunities, particularly in some of the more traditional, we have demanufactured our economy. We have deindustrialized in large parts, and yet we are not addressing the sentiments of people um, that are uh, strongly connected to that economic reality. Last thing I'll say, is I'm fascinated, you talk about immigration, of this city, where we, the, the ghettoization of newcomers to Toronto does not hold. Yeah. Cabbage Town doesn't stay a place for the Irish. Little Italy is no longer filled with Italians. L little Portugal, you go around this city over time, and I think this is a fascinating thing to look at. I think this could be something we could be proud of and talk about that story to the world. How did this city welcome so many people from so many places who naturally come to one locale out of comfort and language and food and all the rest, but don't stay there generation after generation, don't remain economically or socially ghettoized? And I think that's a fascinating thing if you want to look for success as to how this city has broadly been successful at bringing in people from 185 countries from around the world, and we don't have race riots. Mm. Is it our social welfare system? Is it, what, what is it? Is it our urban planning? It's not perfect. It's not. But I've been to the boundaries around Paris. I've been to places around Hamburg, and less Hamburg, more Berlin, and you see the generational ghettoization of people, and you wonder why. Uh, discontentment comes from that place. So I think that the storybook ending or the epoch, the, the ending to that is when we start to see places like Brampton and Richmond Hill starting to, to change their face and nature as well. Um, with that, I would ask you to give your enthusiastic thanks to our panelists, Newt and Nathan. Thanks very much. Thank you. Very good for their profound thoughts.
Randall, back to you. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll break now for lunch, but we will start sharply at 1 o'clock, so a shorter lunch than planned. Thank you. Uh, this is going to be another powerhouse one, a coalition of the modest Canadian and German leadership for a liberal democratic order. And we've got three great participants. Yeah. This will be moderated well, by Roland Nellis, who's the chief US correspondent for Der Spiegel, which is often falsely described in the English press as the equivalent of Time magazine. It's not, because Time magazine is boring, whereas the Spiegel is punchy and provocative and has uh, been an a, a absolute feature of post-war German democracy uh, before and after and during the Spiegel Affair. Our other two uh, participants really require no introduction. John Ralston Saul, a major Canadian public intellectual, and Jan Gronis, uh, Jan Janice Gross-Stein, another major public intellectual, but far more importantly, Janice Stein is the founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs. So I'll turn it over to all of you. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much uh, for being here. Um, I know that our two guests, they don't need an introduction. I think the only one who needs one is me, so I will say a little bit about me. Yeah, I just, I just do a little bit uh, of introduction about me. Uh, actually, I am chief correspondent in uh, Washington, but I'm only there since two years, so before that. I was in uh, Berlin for more than 20 years as a political correspondent in Berlin for German and European politics. And it was supposed to be a kind of reward for me to go to Washington DC <laughs> uh, and report on US politics. And it turned out it wasn't really a kind of reward in a way. I mean, it's great to live in DC and it's great to be in North America, but of course it's a lot of work there. And um, I, I even sometimes I have my phone out here and check uh, the Twitter feed uh, during, during panels <laughs> because so much is going on. So Canada is for me um, a very interesting place. Uh, I, I have to admit, I already admitted that to John, that it's only my second time in Canada. It's really horrible, I have to say. Um, uh, no, 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 not at all, not at all. And uh, my only relation, I have to, I'm typical German in a way here, because my only relation to Canada before I came to North America was my Blackberry. Uh, and um, now, uh, of course, it's an iPhone, I'm sorry for that. Uh, and um, uh, uh, I mean, I'm typical German in a way because um, I started to see Canada completely different, in a different way. Um, uh, a few years ago. It started for me a few years ago. It changed profoundly. What um, changed? Yeah, I tell you, I tell you. Uh, uh, it, changed, um, it, it changed in two ways. Uh, first of all, of course, Justin Trudeau got elected, and he is a super uh, star in Europe as well. Um, I th I've, I le I've learned now that he isn't anymore in Canada, um, but in Europe he still is, and uh, a lot of Germans started to being interested in uh, Canadian politics uh, with the election of Justin Trudeau. Um, so this is one of the, the big changes that took place in the Canadian and German relationship. And the second one uh, was of course the election of Donald Trump. And with the election of Donald Trump, suddenly um, Germans and Canadians uh, found each other on the same side uh, of, of the world order in a way because uh, we suddenly we lost the United States as a very important ally and suddenly we had um, Canada as one of the most important allies on important issues such as human rights, uh, 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 international trade, uh, um, the, 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 the world, world peace in a way also uh, without uh, force and, and things like that. So Canada, Angela Merkel and Justin Trudeau, of course, as you know, work together very well. Uh, and um, for me personally, it was a shocking moment in a way, the G7 summit in Quebec, uh, when suddenly um, the US turned its back uh, towards uh, its allies. Uh, you, of course, remember this moment when Donald Trump didn't sign the, the, the declaration. 
and Angela Merkel and Justin Trudeau, together with Macron, they were kind of left there as uh, the defenders of the of the um, yeah the the world order that had been established by the United States. And the same thing happened even worse uh, at the G20 summit in Argent Argentina, where. Um, Angela Merkel was late because her plane was broken. Not and a good story. It, it was a great story. She went. Not a good one for German industry. Yeah, she flew. She flew commercial. And it was a Spanish plane. Then she she had to take a Spanish plane to get to the G20 summit. And um, but this was not the real story. The real story about the G20 summit was um, that Angela Merkel and Justin Trudeau, along with Macron, kind of were the, the last guys standing there for the old world order. And um, suddenly the crown prince of Saudi Arabia was greeted there as a special guest. Uh, Vladimir Putin was laughing and all the other strong men together with Trump were having a good time where, while all the other three were kind of marginalized in a way. So here I am in the middle of our uh, discussion, which I want to start right away with you guys. Uh, you are already impatient, I, I, I realize that. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. So, um, this was a this was a for me it was a shocking moment, and um, because I wrote about it and I thought, well, this is something something has really changed here, and uh, the question that I'm asking myself since then, and which I'm asking you now, and I, John, I would love if you could start off here with this question, is are Trudeau, Merkel, and the defenders of the liberal world order as we know it, are they actually already losing their fight to Donald Trump and all the authoritarian leaders? Uh, or is this still an open game? What do you think? What's your take on it? Well, um, I mean, first, uh, you know, Washington is a very exciting place in the same sense that Twitter is exciting. It, it, it's pretty meaningless and very predictable. Yeah. And you can, and the purpose of what's happening now is you can fill your entire day with what could be written about at a great distance without looking at any media at all. It's pretty so predictable. Turn off your Twitter. It, we, it's pretty predictable what's happening and where it's all going and what's going to happen. There are a couple of choices. On the other hand, Canada is really very mysterious and very complicated. And what's interesting about it is that, uh, from a German point of view, th th this is one of the few really functioning uh, federations, democratic federations in the world. You're now in the oldest continuous democratic federation in the world. March 11th, 1847, 1848, right? We're the only country that didn't fall apart in the spring of 1848, we're semi-colony. So there's an enormous experience of federalism here, which is very similar to German federalism. And the only other country I can think of would be India. You know, the United States is a broken federation and has been since the Civil War, right? Uh, so there's something very, very interesting for Germans, quite natural for Germans in terms of how do you think about how a state functions, how power functions, what multiple levels of power function like. And when you're a German, you can often feel we're the only people, nobody else in Europe understands what we do. The answer is Canadians can understand it really, really easily, but you have to really understand how complicated Canada is and how mysterious and bizarre the Canadian experiment is and how completely different that experiment is from what's happened in the United States. Um, uh, the second thing I would say, and then I'll answer your question, is that, and, and we already know that Janice and I agree on this, is that um, it's not surprising that little group. I mean, Macron is sort of in a peculiar position, an odd position in the three. But the other two are very similar, Germany and Canada, that we've been lying to ourselves longer than anyone else about what was happening in the United States. Uh, we've always, you know, if you become Prime Minister of Canada, your primary job is to manage, uh, what is it, 7,000 kilometers or six? I always forget, seven? What's the border, seven? Seven, a 7,000 kilometer border with Rome. That's your job. That's been the job of the Canadian Prime Minister since 1867, in fact, since 17 something. That's what your job is. 
And um, it's particularly difficult when there's instability in the United States. That's when it's hardest. So we're now entering into a very long-term period of instability. It already had begun. We were in denial because, of course, on the surface, we had this brilliant prince, Obama, who was you know, internationalist, superior, so much more intelligent than anybody else in Washington, et cetera. But what we, it allowed us to deny what was really happening in the United States. Now we can see it. And we have to live with it. And I think Germany was so stuck on the, what did you, it's always called what, the Atlantic Alliance, which didn't mean the Atlantic Alliance at all. It meant Germany and Washington. It's very precise. It didn't have anything to do with anybody else. It's just Germany and Washington. And so you were in denial of what was actually happening. It was falling apart long ago. The signs were all there. And so suddenly both of us have been woken up and we've been forced out of our virginal state. Uh, in terms of our relationship, and we now have to learn to build completely different kinds of relationships. So we can talk about that later, how you build completely different kinds of relationship. And it's going to be, in different ways, as hard for the Germans as it is for the Canadians. There are real problems here, real problems, and I think there are in Germany. And then, just in the last comment, I would, uh, and so, they have to work together. Because, you know, the old colonial thing in Canada is, well, we better get along with the British and we've got to get along with the French or they're going to interfere here. Right? That was, uh, uh, Chrétien put the French problem to bed, thanks to his chief of staff who'd been mayor of Quebec City. Um, uh, but, you know, you, there's a sort of, we have to get on with the French just to keep them out of our way. But the real relationship is not with Britain or France. The real relationship is and should be with Germany. There's no question about that in my mind. But we have to figure out how to do that. And so that's the job, I mean, Merkel and her successor and, and Trudeau, and, uh, and in spite of, uh, I, you know, I'm, I may be totally wrong, I imagine he will be around for another four years. Um, having just, anyway, uh, I imagine that's what will happen. But Canadian politics is, you, you, it's not like American politics. It is an incredibly verbally and emotionally violent politics. And it's very violent because we don't kill people that much. So we take it all out verbally. We replace the guns with the words. So people, I've known all my life, the Europeans saying, oh my God, Canada's falling apart. Oh my God, oh my God. And you say, no, no, that's what Canadian politics is like. So you just have to relax a bit and work your way through it and see where it comes out in the end. And, and I think they're sort of, I think that, the, the need is there, and if they identify the need properly, uh, they'll figure out how to work together. And the French will sort of follow along while talking about universal values that they invented. You, might, you might have realized you didn't really answer my question. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. But anyway, but, uh, it, was, it was super interesting listening to you anyway. So Janice, perhaps, so let perhaps me, you want to answer the question. Let, uh, me, let is, me agree. Are they winning or are they losing the fight? Oh, well, do let that me, later on. But do it, that. But yeah. let, me, let me agree with John, but frame it a little differently. Yeah. Right? Um, the, the vaunted liberal international order was not very liberal for most of the time that the order existed. But we don't want to talk about that. That's not comfortable. In fact, it was a hegemonic order created by the United States at a time when the rest of the world was flat on its feet, devastated by war. And hegemons create orders because it's in their interest to do so. The British did it before for 150 years, and it wasn't very liberal either. What it was, it was about open markets and freer and freer trade because there's a self-interest of a hegemonic power to do that. And when you are in those periods, the hegemon benefits and everybody else benefits too. So your question is fundamentally wrong. Let me say that. Of course. Of course. <clears throat> and beyond that, it's journalist. dangerous. It's a dangerous question. And why is it a dangerous question? Because and here's where I would take your argument, John, and make it much bigger. It's not only what was happening in the United States. No, I'm just starting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's too narrow, right? Because something very profound was happening in China. Uh, something very profound has happened in China. China is a great power. There's no more emerging power. China's a great power. And its leadership changed in 2011 and took China in a very different direction. And we were in denial about that, too. 
right? Something very important has happened in Russia. And if you look at those three great powers, because they are the only three great powers left, Europe is a wonderfully civil place, but it's no longer astride the world in the same way. And that's a hard conversation. It's, sorry, Randall. It's large, it's civil, um, it's integrated, but it is not astride the world in the way that it was in the 19th century and the 20th century. So the three great powers are led by men who are nostalgic for the past. Donald Trump has a fantasy about some past, he never makes it clear because he's not articulate enough or rational enough to make it clear, about some greatness in the past that he's looking back at. Xi Jinping is very explicit about what he's looking back at. He's looking back at a time that China stood astride the world economy. And it's very clear what Putin is looking back toward. When we talk about Germany and Canada, if we're going to look back at an order whose time is gone, we are not going to serve our countries well. And we will not serve our citizens well. And we will be very badly equipped to deal with the challenges that I've just identified. So this would be a typical uh, journalist's question now. What's, what's your take? I mean, what's the strategy then to develop? What's the new strategy here for Canada, for Germany, if they want to form what's called a modest coalition? I mean, what, what's, what's, what's your take? Well, can I fir first take Janice's point one step further, which, which is because I, I mean, there's one bit I disagree, but I mean, sure. I basically agree, which is that, that, that in, uh, in most people's minds in Europe uh, and in North America, in spite of what Janice just said, which is so self-evident and true, right? We, we have not digested it, that we have completely moved out of a Manichaean world, you know, uh, it's the free world against, it's the, 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 the communist world against. We, we've completely moved out of that. And you know, if you read, uh, and if you read the leader of the opposition of Canada's speech on foreign policy from a few days ago, which was then reviewed by the press uh, fairly negatively, but it, with very little imagination as to what it. Imp they said it was sort of old-fashioned, but it was completely bipolar. It was completely, you know, we have to stand with the free countries against the dictatorships, and and half of it was about the problem of China and he didn't mention Europe, right? So that sounds like he would agree with, in a way, your analysis. Perhaps no, Janice is no, no. advising <laughs> him. Perhaps Janice is advising him. I don't, yeah, I don't know. No. <laughs> but, but, so, but, but what we're, it's clear that what comes after the globalist ideology is a regional system. Agree. And we're moving back into the pre-European empire period, which suits the Chinese just fine, which is where you're going to have, and there's where I slightly disagree, where I think you're going to have like five powers, with three you've named, Europe is another one and India is another one. And maybe if Iran weren't so close to Turkey or if Iran and Turkey could get on, that would be the other one. Um, and we're now, so everybody has to come radically change their ideas about virtually everything international because we're back in the 17th century in a thing where these people are going to go at each other for and they're going to try and control things on a geographical basis with little sorties like the Chinese and uh, taking over Europe and America's position in Africa not for political reasons just for the just for the, the stuff right they don't want to be there they just want the stuff But so it's not, it's not like the British and French empires and German empires in Africa. It's not, it's not that at all. But if you're going back to this time, I mean, we're talking about getting stuff by going to war, of course. Yeah. I mean, this can't Absolutely. be... It's about war. It's yeah. about war. I mean, but yeah. this can't be the strategy for Canada and Germany, right? Oh, so, so, let's take, so, so let's take apart your question. Okay. What does it mean uh, for Germany and Canada to form a coalition? You, John talked about how the governance of Germany and Canada is very similar, which is true, which is our domestic governance, but our positions are very different. We live next door to one of the raging superpowers. 
Uh, Germany le lives next door to a raging, aging bear, uh, but it's a declining power in a way that the United States is not. And Germany's deeply embedded in Europe, and he is the leader of Europe. There's no, it doesn't matter what the optics say, Germany is the leader of Europe by any meaningful indicator. And it's actually a position which Germans, for historical reasons, are not comfortable acknowledging. And that's what makes bearing some of those burdens of leadership very difficult for Germany. So Canada and Germany face very different challenges internationally. And although we like each other, um, that's not going to be enough to form a coalition, right? Because coalitions are driven when there are shared projects. And it's not entirely clear on what fundamental shared projects uh, Germany and Canada come together. The way I would put, I, I'm not quite as pessimistic as John is about war, uh, but what we are seeing is what I call the rebordering of the world. Uh, we lit, the period from 1985 to 2007 was a period of globalization on steroids. That's over. This is not the first time in history that globalization has receded and the world has re-regionalized. Huh. We are in that period now where the world is re-regionalizing. You are the leader of one very important region. We are alone, isolated, and Canadians just know this in their fingertips. It's a very easy conversation to have with Canadians. And frankly, uh, we, we are at the receiving end of an extraordinarily difficult president in the United States and a really assertive, um, furious China <laughs> um, because of something that really we could, that was not our responsibility. And Europeans are not very interested in our predicament. I don't notice Germany or Macron. Theresa May can't do anything but what she's doing, and she can barely do that. Um, so it really doesn't matter. Um, but you know, there's not there's not a, a discussion. Yeah. So, with Canada so if I understand you right here, it's it's Canada is already kind of to be to to stay in my kind of in, in my talking points. So Canada, move off them. Ca it's okay. Canada, I, I, it's it's difficult for Germans to move off a, a certain standpoint. You standpoint. can move. You're more flexible. So 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 if 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 it's if it's if it's right. So so that means that Canada is kind of already losing to this uh, wave of populism and of strengths no. protected by China and the USA. Think and and is Germany right. and Europe are kind of yeah they're they're in a better in a better position. Because they still have Each chance other. again versus China versus Russia, but also versus USA. Because they still can get come together as Europeans, figure out a way to 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 build a stronger alliance within Europe and to counter with all this power that they they theoretically have counter Russia, the USA, and the threats that's coming from this direction. Whilst Canada is completely isolated uh, on a kind of island here. Uh, next to a to a to a United States uh, governed by by Donald Trump. So we've always been that isolated. Yeah, so we've got 500 no. years of this problem. Yeah. In terms of immigration and setting up a country, we've we've got a half a, a millennium of this. We've had, been at it a long time, and uh, you know, as Dan says, we, we wake up in the morning. We know that we know we've got the 7,000 kilometer border. And usually, when we listen to Europeans or others talk about the United States, we sort of laugh to ourselves. Because every morning it, we ingest it. Yeah. We just ingest it. <laughs> yeah. we, we know exactly what's going on there if we're honest with ourselves. The problem is politically we haven't been honest with ourselves. But Canadians have a very good sense of what it's like to live in a mental state which is on the one hand a, plane, a, 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 a geographical plane with, the, with Rome on the other side of the border. But on the other hand, the only way out of that is to be as nice as you need to be, as hypocritical as you need to be, to lie whenever you need to lie, to pretend you're giving in when you know you're not, to say, we'll give them this and we'll take that. It's, that's our job. We've, we've been doing this for a long time. But that makes us very good at spatial, spatial thinking. 
This is the country of Harold Innes and Marshall McLuhan. We invented spatial thinking in the modern era. And it's not an accident. It's not an accident. That's how we've survived this long. So, you know, the pessimistic, in this case, I think, you know, Janice has given you a perfectly accurate pessimistic view, but the, 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 not the optimistic view, the survival view is that we're very good at what we do, which is holding Rome off, the only country basically in the Americas to have held them off since 1814. Remember, they've invaded everybody else multiple times since 1814. And we've just lied and cheated and <laughs> done everything we needed to do to keep them on their side of the border. Mexico hasn't managed that. Nobody else has managed that. Panama hasn't managed Man None of them have managed it. So you, you never underestimate the duplicitous nature of Canadian uh, society. No, I, <laughs> I, I, I understand. I wouldn't agree totally with John, but careful. let me tell you what I do agree with <laughs> and what is delightful to hear. What is, what is delightful to hear and refreshing to hear, and I hope everybody takes this away. We are not nice. Okay. Yeah, which is which is nice. That's was my point, really. Yes, yes. we are not <laughs> nice. We love. We flatter ourselves how nice and how decent we are. And but we isn't that the duplicitousness? We lie to ourselves no. more than anybody else. We, are we know not, we're doing it. Well, some days we do, some days we don't. That's the trouble, and I worry about the days we don't. Yes. We're not the champions of human rights in the world, frankly. We don't pay much of a price for it, and whenever we have to pay a price, we quickly go below the radar. We're not the champions of the liberal international order, except when it absolutely suits our interests, right? And if we can be honest with ourselves, we will fare much, we will do even better than we normally do, John, at managing through very but difficult from a, times. Excuse me, but ahead. from a German perspective, for example, from your European ex perspective, uh, I have to disagree because you disagree. I, I have to disagree because I actually think Canadians are nice, and and you don't know us well enough. Yeah, the, you know, but I'm getting to know you, and I'm still, I still, I'm still Wait, don't so change my mind. And and there is an important things about human rights. Um, what Germans and C Canadians have a very impressed with the stand that uh, your foreign secretary is taking on human rights. It's really impressive uh, what she's doing. Uh, it's, oh, it was really impressive to see the ho your whole go the government. Uh, it was really impressive to see what she was doing with Saudi Arabia, whilst uh, Germany was s struggling really hard for a pretty long time about the question, which is very easy to answer, um, whether we, we should deliver arms to Saudi Arabia after the dramatic killing of Khashoggi happened. But, uh, Canada took a pretty clear stand. And what I really, what I felt was really embarrassing for Germany and Europe in a way, was that we didn't really stand with the Canadians uh, in a way, that, but that C Canada was left uh, pretty much alone, so also, I, also on China. So I think a lot of that is this, you know, this, this uh, and I think Germany needs it and has it in many ways. Yes, Germany is leading a continent, but its survival is really also about spatial thinking. Because it has, and I, I don't necessarily think Russia is in retreat. I mean, I think it's there are many aging. ways. It's it, well, aging. The, yes, but there are many ways of the United States is demonstrating that if if the economy is in trouble, you concentrate on uh, having total control of five internet monopolies and the and fifty percent of the world's uh, defense budget. So that makes up for your weaknesses in other areas. Russia is doing some, is, has, has tools it's using. I know it's a big difficulty, but you can go a long time and be a mess if you're, if you're determined, you know? <laughs> and the KGB are very organized. They're very, very organized. I'm going to disagree on this one. But, but, okay. but anyway, I, I think that, 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 that what you know, Canada has in common with Germany is this need to be very nimble on our feet to think spatially, even though it looks like our destiny is decided by our geography, we have to be nimble, very, very nimble. And what we try to stand for uh, it, it requires a spatial approach, not a kind of linear approach. What does my neighbor think? It really has to be taken to the international level. The Canadian thing, you know, we started inventing it, flawed and hypocritical though it may have been, we started inventing it as a way of dealing with the British. Remember, this is the first country, first colony, to talk its way out of an empire. In the 1840s, we, you know, the Americans had to go to war. We, t we fooled the British into giving us semi-independence in 1848. We talked our way out. 
It's very interesting as a phenomenon. And um, you know, after the Second World War, we, we, we sort of gave up the military stuff to a great extent, not entirely, but you know, Pearson was at the center of building NATO. Canada was the center of building the United Nations, et cetera, et cetera. Why were we doing that? Because we were thinking spatially about how do we create, if people talk about multilateralism, forget that terrible word. We were trying to think, how do we create a, a, a spatial structure which gives us some room, uh, some, something that looks like a defended border by creating counterweights for us elsewhere. And we played that game. And now there's a need to completely reinvent it again. It completely does. reinvent it, it again. Does. With some of those tools, but a whole bunch of new tools. And I think that's an area where, you know, Germany and Canada, unlikely allies in many ways, have a great deal to do together, frankly. You know? Well, let me disagree just briefly with John about Russia. Um, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I know it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Russia has the lowest life expectancy of any G7. Uh, it's not a G7, it's a, an X G, it's a G8, but now X G7 country, but of any developed economy in Europe. It is a, an oil and gas economy. It's absolutely stunning when you look at the Russian economy. It's just oil and gas. It's actually, um, in some ways, worse than Saudi Arabia's economy because Saudi Arabia is diversifying to some degree and Russia is really not. Um, so you have some, uh, uh, a strong man, a thug, that's really what he is, just a thug, who uses um, tools which are inexpensive but effective disruptors at low levels. So you use cyber tools to disrupt elections and just to disrupt neighboring governments and that's really being the Russian strategy. It has no capacity to go to war against anybody, frankly. It has not kept up its military establishment in any meaningful way. So I call it the aging, raging bear. But it is there, the gap between the United States and China on the one hand and Russia on the other continues to grow all the time. For the Europeans, however, Russia is a next door neighbor yeah. with a capacity to disrupt. Uh, and it, you know, it's, it has, it's motivated in a way that some of our European friends are not to deploy inexpensive cyber weapons uh, to do things that probably no European government would do in a comfortable way, and that's what makes it such a problem. But it's frankly a regional problem, Russia's a regional problem. That's all it is. Well, except that, I mean, so I, I, this is a kind of I don't like, take it this seriously. Is like, no, no, this is like a sort of <coughs> Trump comment, I'm not as in the man. No, Trump. Yeah. Uh, Trump please tweet it then. For, for, uh, for, for, for complete accidents uh, of, of position, I spent a lot of time with Putin. Uh, more than... You think he's a thug? Uh, well, I spent a lot of time with him from basically when he came to power until 2006. It was good years. Is good years. But right. I got a, you got a chance to see, and I mean, I mean time like an hour and a half, two hours, in private conversations or small groups, uh, where he was talking quite openly, and um, what what's clear is this guy is really smart. He's you know what kind of smart? No, it, multiple kinds of smart. But it's 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 not thug smart. It's 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 um, uh, spy smart. Yes, yeah, so spy, knows how smart. To yeah, spy he, smart. He's he knows spy how smart. to listen. Yeah. Uh, among, in my life of meeting, because when I was president of Penn, I spent six years meeting thugs right. to try, presidents and prime ministers and ministers, trying and, to get them to stop killing people. And he, uh, and he mm. stands out as one of, the, and I've met most of the democratic leaders over the last whatever, and he stands out as one of the very few leaders who knows how to listen, which is an enormous strength if on top of that you're... I, I, I'd like to come back to... to, but, but, to but, so anyway, yeah. but, mm. but I do think that... But um, he's really adept at putting his opponents in jail, too. Oh, God, no, very, very no, good no, at it. I, 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 I'd, I'd like to come back to, to Germany and Canada again. Yeah, so what so I give, me, to give me... I mean, Russia is super interesting. <laughs> Can we talk uh, about two things? I'd like just to let me just All let right. me ask this question. I told I, you we were going to. Be yeah, no, I know Russia is super interesting, and you you know you as you might know the Germans are really split on the question of how to handle Russia. It's a it's a huge it's topic. It's a long hit subject it's, in it's, Germany. It's, it's, it has a long history. I don't want to get into this. You know that much better than I do, probably. But 
here's my question on Canada and Germany. What's your optimistic outlook for Canada and Germany if they work together? What topics should they engage more frequently in their foreign policy? What what are what are really the shared interests? We, uh, Janice, perhaps you you want to start with that. So what? I mean, right. you didn't mention, for example, you didn't mention one one topic. It didn't come up at all, and I'm really surprised. What's that? Climate change. So you didn't mention this this super topic. My daughter said talk about it all day long. It's it's the only political that's issue they this, are interested in. That's part in. of the spatial. That's so, part of the spatial. So that, tell that's me, where please tell me, together. please tell me, what is um, what is the shared interest? What what are the big topics? And what is the optimistic out uh, Ausblick? We would say in German for for Germany and Canada. W where can they work together? Is it climate change? Is it human rights? Give me some optimistic takes here. Janice, you want to start? Let's start with John. He's an optimist. No, I would say there's two things that we could, that are not, um, you know, climate change is self-evident. And, you know, there's no question that if you have two countries that are, it, 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 even if you're bigger and more powerful than us, we're in a very powerful position uh, on that subject. The, the, if we could take leadership on that subject or be among the three or four or five leaders on that subject, it gives that spatial approach towards how power will work in the world. It gives us enormous influence on the cause of, in the cause of good, in the actual cause of good. And so Canada needs to be really shoved, and I know less about the German. We, we say the same kinds of things. Um, the record's not very good. Uh, in some things it is, and some things it isn't. It's uneven. It's very uneven. But it, 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 there's no question this is an area we need to work on very seriously. So we need not to lie to ourselves on that one either. No, no, I'm okay. not, as you know, I'm not into delusion on no. oneself. But uh, I do think but we that tell ourselves how good we are and that we're not. I think we should, I think it's important to talk about trade, believe it or not, coming from the novelist. And uh, I think it's important to talk uh, <laughs> about immigration. I think on the, on the trade front, Uh, we have a lot to learn from Germany, and on the immigration front, you have a reasonable amount to learn from us. Not as much as most people think, but a reasonable amount. So, I mean, I think it would be interesting to take 10 minutes on each of those, and we could, we could start with trade, if you like. You, you know, this is surprising, some people thinking coming from me, but, you know, we've signed, uh, um, Harper, whatever you think of him, started, uh, carried on the negotiation quite well. Trudeau put it to bed, and so did our foreign minister. CETA. You know, CETA, and did it, and it's a flawed trade deal, like all these deals, they're flawed. But what it does from the Canadian point of view is it actually opens up a, a real a, a spatial reality opportunity, which is not the United States. Um, And you tricked the United States as well, pretty well. We did pretty well. That was part of that. See, when I, I think about devious, everybody thought we were keeping our, uh, we were giving in. And in fact, in the end, we held fairly tough. And, you know, the criticisms of the deal of giving in are basically wrong. Uh, but that's without analyzing all sorts of things that I don't like in the deal. But, but we sort of put them to sleep. The United States. Hmm? You, the United States as yeah. well? We yeah, we basically put them to sleep. We went on and on and on and on the way we do when we're dealing with them. And, and they thought they were being tough and everything. We just kept talking and de deviating and everything. But, but here's the interesting thing. We have this deal with Europe, which for the first time in our history opens up a real possibility. Why do I say a real possibility? Because, of course, China was some sort of possibility, which goes back to John Diefenbaker and the Conservatives and Alvin Hamilton, and, uh, who opened up the Chinese market for Canadian agriculture in the late 50s, early 60s. But we always knew what the problem was. It was this belief that we could go much, much further with China, which was the delusional thing. So this, uh, to me, there's no big surprise in what's happening now. It, it, we, we'll have to wait a while, and we're caught between the two of them, and it's just a real mess. But, but the really interesting thing is that the United States, most Canadians don't understand this. This is our real problem. The United States has a population of now 350 million. A little more. With a middle class of about 150. Okay, and it's not all that interesting a middle class from an economic spending point of view, consumption point of view. Europe has a population without Britain of 450 and a middle class of 250, which it's is more 300, I guess, hmm? more 300. 300, so you have a bigger middle class, 
more interesting consumption patterns, more actual, a history of being more loyal in its buying patterns than a, a, a much less complex and interesting uh, consumer class in the United States, which is not that interested in high quality goods, whereas the Europeans are more interested in high quality goods. Here's a fantastic, I'm not being romantic, here is the opportunity for Canada on top of doing India and China and all the rest of it in Latin America. And you look at our business community, with the exception perhaps of Montreal, which is sophisticated and multilingual and is already moving into Europe in an interesting way. You look at the Toronto, the biggest business community in Canada, you look at the numbers. Already the Germans have gone, have something, what, you probably know, Consul General probably knows the numbers. What, 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 the German numbers are going like this, going the up. Canadian numbers are like that. Right. And I've sat at tables, as I'm sure Janice has, of leading business people in this city, and you say, for Christ's sake, don't you understand the size and the richness of the European middle class? Don't, don't you understand? Say, oh, that would be really complicated. <laughs> Look at the hiring patterns. Look at the hiring patterns in Bay Street. Do they have on their hiring thing l languages? Are they hiring that's, people I mean, who have three or four languages? That sounds no. great. I mean, it's super optimistic. There is a lot of chance here. No, there's an enormous yeah. chance if really we could isn't. kick our business class really in, the, in the seat. So there really isn't, okay? Well, Dennis, so, that's so that's I, I thought you were giving well, some optimistic... Uh, let me tell uh, you here. where John is right, but, but Canadians are not up to it. That's I don't agree. I don't agree. They're not we up could to be. it. But we're not. At the moment. We've never been. Uh, no, that's right? not true. Well, in the 30s, we were. Not very, I mean, the 30s were a so, pretty bad period. So let me explain what the issue is here. If you look at Germany, Germany, in an extraordinarily self-disciplined strategy, did two things, right? Which puts Germany where it is today as the economic powerhouse of Europe, which really is, by the way, uh, an economic powerhouse, and Germans don't like it when I say this, who have benefited enormously from the euro, enormously, at the expense of poor southern neighbors, frankly. Yeah. And that's a big part of the German story. It's to my German friends, I'm, my apologies, all right? But that is a big part of it. But what do the Germans do, which we have never done, right? First of all, the Germans restructured their economy at con some considerable pain under Angela Merkel. Um, we don't, we're not willing to do that. And they, made that transition to high value manufacturing. We have not done that in this country. It's been too easy for us. We won't make the structural reforms. We, are, we cling to industries where we are integrated into supply chains at the lower and the medium level. And so when we talk about exporting quality goods to Europe, what dream are we talking about? We don't make them. No, but the, 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 we this is where we actually, them, I agree John. with you about that. But okay. where I actually... Two, sorry. the Germans have an apprenticeship program, yeah. which is brilliant, mm. which trains its young people in ways that are um, socially unacceptable in this country, frankly, because everybody goes to university, right? That's not where Germany is. And Germany has had a brilliant apprenticeship program, and so... If you look at where Germany is as a society, despite all our social supports, the level of inequality is lower because the German economy performs in an entirely different way than the Canadian economy. The reason Canadians have not taken advantage of CETA, we're, on, we're, we're lazy, we're comfortable North Americans, we will not make the effort. We have a risk-averse culture, and our government can sign trade agreements from here till eternity. Nothing changes. Okay, so basically, I agree with everything you've said. <laughs> I, I don't disagree with anything. This is the room. No, no, I, I don't disagree with anything you've said. And you, you know, it wow. was, when I wrote a, a Fair Country, there's a whole section in it called the Castrati, yeah. which is about our business class, and I'm interviewed endlessly. <laughs> About, about this book, and they, there's the first section, there's the second section, then, why are you then the third us? section is the castrati, and then the conclusion. I'm interviewed about three of the four sections. Nobody brings up the business section, right? So anyway, uh, you're absolutely right. We were actually far more adventurous until after the Second World War. So I think it's unfair to say we've never done it. We, uh, we dominated rat poison in Asia. That's great, kind of a joke, but anyway, great. <laughs> you know, it was a big deal. But but what I want what I want to say is what what the interesting thing about the country is, is that 
that if it, when when a political party, and it usually takes two of them, decides on something national, mm -hmm. uh, we actually are capable of it's, doing it? uh, of doing it. We it takes a while, and we are actually capable of putting in place national policies which change the direction of the country. And we have done. And this is this is the other side of it. We're actually perfectly capable of doing the surprising. We usually uh, have some long debate, then we do a royal commission, and then we have a big fight with the provinces, and then we do it. When was that? Oh, the whole series. <laughs> no, no, come on. You know perfectly well what I'm talking about. Talking decades No, ago. no, I'm not. No, no, we're, we're still capable of doing that. I think that th this crisis, which we're entering into, which is a social economic crisis of the West, and we're stuck with the... Bi the big loser, because Russia was already down. Mm. We're, talk we're stuck with the people who are in deep panic because they were up and they're going down. Uh, and that makes them really confused and therefore dangerous. Um, this is a moment when I do think it would be possible in this country to have uh, the, the right kind of debate which allows us, for example, to, th why don't we have an apprenticeship policy? I'm totally agree with you. I think that people are, going to, are already talking about the fact that it was a mistake to gradually turn community colleges more and more into universities. People are already saying, this was a terrible mistake. It's all based on the fact of, of a class idea of education. It's totally wrong. I mean, you know, carpenters make a hell of a lot more money than BAs in, uh, in uh, whatever. Oh, BAs in literature. In literature. In literature. So, I mean, no, they on. do brilliantly. You know, so, so, I mean, people are starting to talk seriously it, about this, about what is the nature of how you want to spend your life. So I think we can do apprenticeship. I think we can, I think the other thing that's happening, and, you know, we have to be careful, you and I, of not speaking for the old Judeo-Christian Canada, which is exactly where you describe them and where I call them the castrati. I think that what's fascinating about immigration to this country, the immigration of the last 50 to 60 years, is that it has brought, as, as, as we brought when we came, has brought not only an incredible uh, business and trade energy, but a completely different approach. Because a majority of that is not coming from Europe and certainly not coming from our, our, our roots. And so I'm all the time, because of the institute that I co-chair, I'm all the time meeting the new Canadian business leadership mm. who are Indo-Canadians, who are Sri Lankan Canadians, who are Chinese Canadians, who are, you go through it, who are South American Canadians. And I'm telling you, they don't have any of the hang-ups that you and I run into on Bay Street. And so you actually sit down with that family that's now worth you know, a couple of billion. They came here and they had a, a, a laundromat and then they went into business uh, building housing. And they're saying, oh well, you know, we, we, we've got a nephew in uh, Lahore and you know, so there, there's a jute factory. And so we're, go we're buying the jute factory in Lahore. And, and they're not going through London. They're not going through New York. They're not going through the United States. They couldn't give a damn about any of that. So there's a, there's a, there's a kind of reinventing of that old uh, risk thing which was so important in Canada and which we lost in the last 50 years being reinvented. The question is how do we, I think, go to those people, not Bay Street, and say, okay, you know how to do this in India, you know how to do this in China, how would you like to do it in Europe? We can help you. But you know what? I mean, uh, so before I let... Strategy. I, 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 I realize that there is something that Europe and uh, Canada have really very much in common here, that Donald Trump and the whole change of the world order, which has of course started much earlier than Donald Trump, really forces Europe, Germany, and Canada, obviously, to 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 debate exactly these questions, and that's a uh, good thing. and that's a good thing, yeah, and 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 I um, I mean in Germany it, uh, in Europe you feel a kind of awakening in a way, uh, especially for the European idea and for the Europeans to come together. Of course, there are many people fighting these ideas, but still the forces that want to bring Europe together as one, they are much stronger than the other forces, and. What you were just saying, in a kind of middle optimistic, pessimistic way, is for me sounding actually sounding optimistic because, of course, we are representatives of a different generation. But for sure, the younger generation in uh, in Canada is, of course, posing exactly these questions, 
and in a much more dramatic way probably than you are doing that uh, already. So and so I, especially the exchange with Europe will be very, will be very, I think this will change and I'm optimistic here because um, CETA and things like that will that will re really bring change also to Canada. Janice, so, so I just, just want to give Janice, Janice... No, I'm just going to throw one more thing in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's, a, here's an interesting thing about the commonalities. So when I was president of Penn, you know, first, Canada has this formal relationship with Mexico. We have no relationship with Mexico. We have now you have one, yeah. Yeah, it, on the treaty, what have we done about it? What have we done about it? I mean, there's been some little efforts by the, the, the current government. We've never done anything about our having a real relationship in Latin America. So, uh, and we need to. This is a government in Mexico that would be happy to have a relationship with us, a real relationship, not through Washington. And this is the first government in Mexico that we could have a real relationship with. This is the most important government to appear in Mexico since the revolution. It may fail, but it's a really exciting risk. So I would go to, I, would, I took three delegations to Mexico because writers are being killed as president of Penn. And I take big delegations, mainly Latin American writers. But the, the non-Latin Americans I took were Germans and Japanese. Uh, the Japanese we're not here to talk about, but what was fascinating was that the German writers and the Canadian writers at the table with the Minister of the Interior and the Minister of Justice of, of Mexico, we were fabulous together. We were fabulous together, and the, and the Mexicans didn't know what to do about us. They couldn't figure out how. You know, they wanted to say, well, you're, you're like Americans, and they, but no, we're sitting here with the Germans. And then they didn't know what to do when the Germans spoke, and then we backed them up. So there's lots of stuff that we could be doing from the point of view of trade, from the point of view of climate, in Latin America, together. Yeah. So I'm, what I'm saying is you have to imagine a whole other strategy in which we do things together, not necessarily simply in our two countries. Yeah, uh, just to, to um, add to what John was saying, to be absolutely serious for, for a minute, uh, um, Canadians really have to do hard work over the next few years, and there's not a long window here, to figure out what the economic future of this country is, because this is a much more unforgiving world than we've lived in, right? For the last 150 years, the British were at the front, uh, and even though we talked ourselves away to some degree, they were still nevertheless a shield, and it was substituted uh, by the United States after the war. Neither of those two are available to Canada. Right. And so we have to, probably for the first time in our history, sit down and really understand, as the fourth industrial revolution begins to gather steam, and we know enough from history that each time these industrial revolutions have swept through the first, the second, the third, they have been enormously disruptive They've dislocated our social arrangements. My favorite way of telling this story is for all of you who have seen a John Turner painting and loved them, that he painted industrial pollution in London yeah. during the second industrial revolution when people left the countryside and came into London to work in factories and lived in unbelievable poverty and worked 15 hour days. That's what industrial revolutions do. They disrupt existing social arrangements. We are in the very early years of the next one. And with all credit to Germany, Germany has been very clear-eyed about this and has understood um, where that next generation of high-value ma manufacturing is for Germany and for Europe and is leader in that. We will never compete at that level. So we have to have that kind of conversation. There is a rich conversation going on right now about agribusiness, which will be digitized, and what Canada can do with its land mass in environmentally responsible ways to supply a growing shortage of nutritious products that are environmentally sustainable. If we're serious about that, we're going to have to make investments and we're going to have to train young people and we're going to have to digitize our agricultural sector and we're going to double down and we're going to say, well, that's a niche because the Germans are not there, right? Because the Germans are a 
excellent. We're not going to compete with you. Janice, John, thank you very much. Can uh, we, so far, yeah, d d hang on, hang on. Done immigration, uh, just just one, really one second. We'll get some questions. Thank you, from you exactly. On. Thank you very much uh, um, until here. So we get some questions. We have these cue cards out, and I have already a first question. And uh, John, you will be very happy to hear that. This question goes to you. And it's, uh, it's surprisingly, it's about Russia. And um, so, yeah, and so uh, it, the question asks um, whether you can uh, explain a little bit more how you see Putin, because you said he's spy smart, he knows how to listen, and then you were uh, trying to finish this, but I cut you off. And, and so the audience asks you to finish this. Oh, no, I mean, there's nothing much to be said. I mean, he, he's, he's spy smart. He has a, 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 it's interesting. There are different senses of humor in leaders. Real thugs, like Stalin, for example, it, it, the sense of humor is, you know, I'm going to kill you, isn't this funny? It's, it's that, you know, it's that kind of humor of the, of the thug. He has a, a very interesting sense of humor. I haven't seen him in a while, so I don't know what he's like now. He's actually quite funny. Uh, he's surrounded himself, again, I'm not a big expert now, uh, with people as smart as he is, which is surprising. I've, I've sat with some of them, and they're, they're, they're not dumbos, I can tell you, and they're very sophisticated. They, from the very beginning... Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm not, listen, I'm not making a moral judgment. There wasn't a single ethical comment in what I'm making, saying. I'm describing in a cold way. Uh, they have decided from the very beginning that they would move out and retake the Russian Empire. It was very clear. I remember having a conversation with the Minister of Defense in 2002, in which he explained to me how they were going to move out uh, in, on, the, on the south border. I mean, that was 2002, right? And they're doing it bit by bit. And people say, oh my God, uh, they've done this. We have to stop them from doing that. That's not the way it works. They've got a map. They've got all these places they want. And they just look for openings. And when they get an opening, they take it. It's as simple yeah. as that. That's what's happening. And frankly, you know, we put some troops in, the, ba in the, um, uh, the Baltic. You know, the Russians could move into those countries, do it in one hour, and not come up against our troops. I mean, you, you, you could do it in a very sophisticated way. They have the ability to do that. Just move in, go around our camps, take the place, and then we're st our soldiers are stuck in their camps, and then they negotiate uh, sending our soldiers back to us. Mm. I mean, they could, do it in, they could do it in an hour, an hour to two hours. So, I mean, you have to be very realistic about what you're dealing with. And I, that's why I worry about calling him a thug, because that is a moral judgment which then makes people think that he's not very bright and not very sophisticated. No, Whereas very, this is very, very smart sophisticated. thugs in the world. Yeah, there are a few. Yeah, it's you true. Have to put the adjective. You have to put the adjective. He's a smart thug who will stop at nothing. No, no, but you have to understand how smart. Yeah. And, and with smart people around him, you know? Here's another question uh, from the audience. Um, I don't know, Janice, perhaps you want to answer this one. How can Canadian entrepreneurs be motivated with the federal government's anti-business policies? Anti Bus business policies. How can Canadian entrepreneurs be motivated given the federal government's anti-business policies? So the answer to that one is very simple. Entrepreneurs are not discouraged or encouraged much by federal government policies, right? So if we want, again, a donkey up there and we want to pin the tail on it, let's go ahead and delude ourselves. Um, the real issue is what will it take to make Canadian entrepreneurs more risk taking? And more I. Entrepreneurs. And more, well, more entrepreneurial. <laughs> so I teach a lot of young people, uh, and John, I know exactly what you're talking about. And the good news is that there is a culture change happening in this country at a younger level, um, across the board, really. And it's of the following kind. Uh, Nobody wants to work for government anymore because they cannot tolerate the pace of it, um, which is great um, in a way. Uh, very few people want to work for big private companies because it's too hierarchical. They're impatient. They're all, they all are checking their Twitter feeds like this guy, right? Which speeds up your brain and diminishes your patience, frankly. And so they want to start stuff. And so they're all starting stuff. Our big problem in this country, and this crosses all our communities, is we start stuff, and when it succeeds, we sell it out. And if we continue to do that, 
we are not going to grow our economy and your grandchildren and children are not going to have the same kind of future and quality of life that you had. It's as simple as that. And that's not a function of government policy. That's a function of a willingness to bear risk. I'm just beginning to see now among people in their late 30s, early 40s, because they're the critical group who've already done, who've already got something going, a few of them are beginning to say, no, we're going to reinvest. We're going to stay the course. We're going to build in this country. So what really has to happen here is we have to, we have to be willing to fail. Because if you're not willing to fail, you can't succeed, frankly. And that's our biggest cultural challenge in this country. It's got nothing to do with government whatsoever. I mean, nothing. The governments of Canada, whatever the marginal. parties, they always try. They're marginal. They're, always, they're they marginal. Play the marginal. But, but, what, but I would add to what Janice just said, and it goes back to what I was saying about the, the new waves of immigration and how they're changing this policy. And they're a big part of what Janice is describing is <clears throat> you're seeing a rebirth in Canada of what existed before the Second World War which was the idea of the family firm. So, you know, the idea that, oh, I'm just starting a company and as soon as I get to 40 million, I'm selling it. I mean, there's going to be a big American company there to buy it. And they'll give you more than it's worth because they want your ideas. So the, the ability to say no, it, it, one of the ways that people say no is it's a family firm and they're in it with the family. It's not just you saying, I want to go and play golf and lie on a beach in Fiji. I don't know what these people, I know so many of them who sold out it. 20 million, 30 million, 40 million, and the rest, they're 45, and the rest of their lives are lost, because they don't know, most of them, they don't know what to do next, because they were trained to build a company. They should have kept it. So now you're seeing these incredible families who are more like, say, an Indian family firm, and they're not the least bit interested in selling because they've got grandchildren who are gonna take it over. So this is a really, there's my really optimistic thing. And I can tell you the statistic, which is stats can. The statistic is that after seven years in Canada, by which time more than almost 90% are citizens. 86% of immigrants become citizens within five years in Canada. I'm going and, to move to Canada. The United States is, the United States is 40%. 40%, okay? And Europe, 10, let's say. Um, that that, that at, after seven years in Canada, the percentage of people who are entrepreneurs is higher than the people born here. Now that's great. That's a of, very optimistic it, number. Yeah, it's a very it, it's much more complicated than that. But it's a really, really. We did a study on it, which I'd be happy to give you. We are we going to talk about immigration? We just did. No, that's yeah. only one part of it. I mean, I really think that, that and, and, and Janice, I'm sure, has some things to say on it. So, you know, I'm co-chair of the Institute of Canadian Citizenship. We do this thing six degrees. And, you know, there are lots of criticisms to be made of the way we do it, immigration. And a lot of it is, part of it's misunderstandings about how the point system works. The point system actually is what opened the doors of Canada to the non-Europeans. That, that's what actually increased the diversity wildly. And a lot of Europeans don't understand that it was a way of breaking the pattern of taking more Brits and whatever, you know? Um, that wasn't its motive, but it was well, its consequence. It, it, well, whatever. That's what happened. Uh, really not whatever, but that is No, no. I, I, don't exa I don't exactly agree but, uh, about that. But the, the, the interesting thing is this, that I think there are some things that we've got right. There are lots of things we've got wrong. Some of the things we've got right because we set up our Ministry of Immigration and Citizenship in 1867 or 68. We've been at this a long time in a very formalistic and intentional way, filled with errors, filled with horrible moments of racism and betrayal and so on. Nevertheless, there's a line. You can see the line through it all, even at the worst moments. And uh, there's a lot of experience that we sort of get quite a few of the things right. And I think that's where uh, we look at Europe and uh, uh, to a great extent Europe, and I think Germany, it's, Germany's getting Far better, but you know, Germany was, is a great immigration country. It's been a great immig immigration, not migrant, immigration country since the Second World War, right away because of the, 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 the German speakers. And it's never dealt with the fact that it is a great immigration country. 
And if you don't, if you, if you can't stand up in the morning and say, I am a German and I belong to a great immigration country, you're going to have a crisis. Because what happens is, you don't have a ministry of immigration and citizenship. You've got a tiny little administrative body under the police, under the Ministry of the Interior. Like every other European country, the first thing that needs to happen in Germany is you need to create a ministry of immigration and citizenship, and I think we can help you do that. That doesn't mean you're in favor of more immigrants. It means you want to have a policy and not a crisis. It means you want to have a large number of civil servants who actually know how to do this in a civil way. Uh, they, then you have this incredible volunteer community in Germany that were fantastic and are fantastic with the Syrians. And, and I can tell you that in Canada, that, that the immigration citizenship policy is 50% the government's department and policy, 50% volunteerism. If you take the government away, the volunteers fall apart. If you take the volunteers away, the government policy falls apart. And Germany could do this. You're so close to doing it. You just have to change structurally to, cre to make it intentional and not by accident. So let me bring Randall in here, who is our chair of migration. Come, just borrow the mic for one minute, because this is what Randall, our director, studies full time. Do you want me to respond to that, Janet? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I was going to make notes to say that in the end. I think um, that simply won't work because the system we have in this country works, but it's not replicable. Re replicable. I'm not calling for it to be replicated. No, 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 let, let me finish my point. What we have here is closed borders and a selection system that allows the admission of high-skilled immigrants. And we have, to quote Donald Trump, a border to the south, a wall to the south of us that we made the Americans pay for. Europe has, <laughs> Europe has none of that. It does not have secure borders. After decades of family-based immigration, there's no way it could make the flip to skilled immigration because the vast majority of immigrants with an entitled, entitlement to enter are family migrants who will make up the majority of, the, of the, the, the entrance. And even if you got around that, which you won't, they're not going to come to Germany anyway because immigrants go where their returns to capital are highest. And that's where taxes are lowest. America, Canada, Australia, and pre-Brexit Britain. Is that right, Janice? Yep. That's not ba basically. I can confirm that the taxes are not the lowest in no, Germany. No, but basically, yeah. I don't agree with that argument. I mean, first of all, no. First of all, the, the whether people are high skilled or not is is actually not the primary point. This country was not built by high skilled people. It was built by, largely by people who came illiterate. Secondly, the point very, is very, very different economy today. All the evidence yeah. shows that high skilled immigrants, where you have a robust welfare state, are a net plus for the economy. Low-skilled immigrants, because of inevitably higher reliance on welfare, are a net cost. It works oh. here, and those those are facts. They're uncomfortable facts, but they're facts. Well, the other well fa established in the literature. But the other facts are that uh, we see that with uh, sponsored uh, refugees, that the takeoff is much much faster than with unsponsored. And you know there, we are moving slowly towards increasing that. I realize that's only a partial program, but you know the turnaround of the Syrians is. Uh, surprisingly fast, considering that the Syrians we took are not uh, highly educated. We took largely the lower educated Syrians out of the camps. The ones coming to Europe tend to be more educated and with a, a little bit more money, which is, allows them uh, to get in. So, I mean, the problem is not replication. We can't replicate the German economy, which is what uh, Janice has been saying. But that doesn't mean that we can't learn from Germany nor does it mean that Germany can't learn from us. Nobody's saying that Germans have to do exactly what we're doing. What I'm saying is the absence of a ministry of citizenship and immigration means that you are forcing yourself into a crisis. You're sitting somewhere in Africa or the Middle East. You're desperate for some reason or another. I don't agree with the differentiation between economic uh, refugees and, uh, and, and war because starving to death is not a particularly pleasant way to live. And um, you know, you say, I'd like to go to Canada. Now, I have many criticisms of the way we do it. Nevertheless, you'll find an embassy filled, it's on a regional basis, filled with specialists in this who can help you. 
great, could be improved enormously. You go to the German embassy, you'll find some visa officers. So what do you do? You get in a boat. You know, you, you, you create a crisis by not having the structures. Here's one of the most sophisticated countries in the world, Germany, which is denying itself the possibility of handling this problem a, in a sophisticated mm. way. It's a, it's, but it's, I'm sorry, I have to finish. It's not, but it's not quite the case, because in fact there are programs for high-skilled uh, immigration to Germany. There's a blue card European program, and the sort of people who show up in Ankara and want to come to Germany are not going to apply that program because they're unskilled, and frankly, they wouldn't come to Canada on the points system either. The, I agree with you that Germany needs a more positive immigration policy, 100 percent, and there've been tentative moves in that direction. But the crisis does not reflect the absence of IRCC. The crisis reflects the fact that the state system of the Middle East completely collapsed, and all those people made it like hell for Germany. No, IR, no Ministry of Immigration would have prevented that crisis. Or by the way, nobody, nobody went to Russia, by the way. But that, but um, but, see, that's, uh, no, we're going to move on. But we're going to move on but just, let me just, just, let me one just line. Line. That's not a mediator. No, no, no. That's not, actually, <laughs> that's not actually an argument. That's a piece of an argument. You're not wrong. <clears throat> but it's a small slice of an argument. If you deny yourself the mechanisms, then you end up with the crisis. Yeah, when the crisis comes, there are various ways of handling it. If you don't give yourself the various ways, I only named one of them, there are a whole pile of others, then you will be in the crisis. I think just to put this discussion in context is a very important one because immigration, as we know, is one of the hottest topics which um, is being exploited by many of the right-wing populist movements that are sweeping across Europe and in North America and in our own country. Um, although it's, the, the voices are a little more muted, but we are not immune from this. But there is a larger issue here that there is a failure of governance, deep failure of, the, of state governance in large parts of the Middle East, partly as a result of outside interveners, partly as a result of domestic causes. And there, we are literally talking about 65 million people on the move, which no matter how many offices of, or officers we have, and no matter how many ministries of citizenship and immigration we have, we have a global problem now of an order of magnitude that we have not experienced since the end of World War II. That's an entirely separate subject. It's but not it's separate. A it's huge part of it. Problem. It's part of it. Huge and problem. but you, you know, in order to handle to get to face that problem. I don't even know how we handle that problem right. because it's got enormous political, economic, and military consequences. But you have to be able to dot every time somebody says something practical, step back and say, no, you can't do anything practical because. No, but we you have, have to. You have to look at the Europe at the, and look at the self-evident things that aren't being done. Do those that least puts you in a position to do Listen, something else. Listen, there's no argument about that, just, just let me, just, just let me, Sorry. Just let me sneak in here. Um, just a final comment from me on this. Uh, from a German perspective, the, the main problem is not having a no ministry of immigration. The main problem is that we don't have a European uh, immigration policy. And, uh, you can't call and for a European one if you don't have a German one. That, that doesn't work. Um, but this is what all Germans are saying. The Germans are saying, okay, we can start talking about a German immigration policy as soon as we have a European one because they are interconnected. And uh, that's, a, that's a very difficult debate. And I see that uh, this... Uh, topic migration is also a very hot topic in Canada. It is. It and is. of course... Except we use the word immigration. But, and and I've, as I learned from the first panel, I mean, the, the numbers are a little bit different from the numbers in Germany. Uh, but still, it's a hot topic. Here's the good and, news. Uh, Here's and the good news. Let me just share the good news. Some good news. I'm, yeah. I'm in the news business. Nobody so take in the world good news. right now immigrating to Russia. We have nobody in the world right now immigrating to China, although there was our early discussions, right? The immigration rate to the United States has dropped. Um, and we in Canada are the great beneficiary, frankly, of a talent pool, um, which is extraordinary and which is just of enormous benefit and value to us. But let's not kid ourselves that we're nice. We are, and I didn't we are say that. skimming <laughs> the world's best talent in a rigorous point system 
because of changes that are going on around the world. You, you know, I just have to say, I go to citizenship ceremonies on a regular basis. No, you do. And I see who's becoming a citizen. And the idea that the only people benefiting from the point system are Mainly. The, the top. Mainly. It, it, it's really, you know, the family reunification, it often means there's one person in the family and the rest of the family uh, is not. And, and, I, and That's dropping as part of our immigration, John. Well, it, it, it goes, the, the thing I, is, I, we've I, been doing it for 150 years. These things go up and down. Right now, and we're, we're, right now we're taking about a million people every four years. Yeah. That's great. I have to cut it off now here. Okay. Janice, John, thank you very much. It was... <laughs> <laughs> It was super interesting uh, to listen to you and your thoughts, and uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much to the audience for the questions and for listening uh, to this lively debate. And uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be back for sure here in Canada, and I already love it very much. So thank you very much. Very well, well, I, if thank I could you. just you. say one more word. Um, which is a thank you to Randall for joining in the discussion, but also a special word of welcome to the Consul General of Germany. Uh, you've been great partners uh, with the Monk School for years. We've had many wonderful academic exchanges as a result of leadership that we've had from the consulate, from the embassy in this country, and it's a personal pleasure for me to see this relationship continue and deepen under Randall. So thank you very, very much. And, and, I, and I could just, if I could just add, and great partners with Six Degrees, which we really love, work, we really love working with you on it. The love is mutual. Yeah. <laughs> and and what, what most people don't know is we do a Six Degrees now once a year in Berlin. So we've been talking about all these issues in Berlin, and I can tell you, people are far more positive to our arguments. And I, I can, but I can't promise you that the uh, airport will be open when you come to Berlin the next. Okay, time. I'm, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to end the love in because we're we're running out of time. So I think we proved definitively that we're not nice. In fact, we're sitting there waiting for the moment to savage each other, and you should see what we do to a baby seal when you put it in front of us. So Canadians are anything but nice. Absolutely. Uh, it's my job to do a quick summary, and I'll be quick since we're really almost out of time. Uh, we started out with an optimistic picture of the European Parliament uh, elections. The suggestion was that the far right will do well, uh, but will be nowhere near a majority, and that the left and the right, the pro-Europeans and the rest, will need to work together to make the European Parliament work. Uh, um, State Secretary Sch uh, Schmidt made the excellent point that Populism is not democracy, because democracy is for everyone, and populism is only for a few. And indeed, they demonize the majority of the population. And as we see in Hungary, they're not populist in the sense that they're not interested in giving the power to the people. What they're in fact doing is interested in capturing power for a small, corrupt, self-serving elite. True in Warsaw, true in Budapest, True in Washington, we had a lot of fascinating discussions about Canada, um, some opinion poll data from Angus Reid suggesting that on the back of very small numbers entering as undocumented migrants or as refugees, trivial compared to Germany, we're seeing a turn, not a definitive turn, but a turn against immigration. For the first time since we've begun doing opinion polls, a majority of this country wants fewer immigrants. Canada was always the statistical outlier in that respect, a majority wanting the same or more. Um, we had our little scrap about migration, so I won't repeat immigration there. Um, uh, we could debate the, uh, the semantics of it. There's an argument in favor of both. Um, and then the last panel, my goodness, yes, of course. I, I just have my tweets there. The last panel said all sorts of fascinating things. New immigrants are reinventing the risk that uh, old Canadians have, uh, the risk taking that old Canadians have lost, they not Bay Street have the ideas and the strategies. Canadian businesses have utterly failed to exploit the opportunities presented by a larger and more sophisticated middle class. Canadians win by talking, and I thought you were implying boring the Americans to death, but whatever happens, <laughs> it, it seems to work. Uh, Russia, 
is not a threat. It is a declining power, oil dependent, with the lowest life expectancy in the world. No, uh, no. Uh, sorry, world. sorry, in the, in the XG8, the XG8. Yeah. I'm not reading my own, my own tweets. Germany and Canada like each other, but coalitions need a shared interest. They have none. Germany is a regional leader. Canada is isolated and alone. And the liberal democratic order was neither liberal nor democratic. It was a hegemonic system based on U.S self-interests. Thank you very much for all your contributions. This was one of the liveliest meetings that we've had. Thank you for coming.